Uh, hi, we're going to get started in just a minute, so if you can take your seats, we'll, we'll get going. Hi everyone, uh, why don't we get started. Welcome to the New York University School of Law. My name is Scott Hemphill and I'm a professor here at the Law School. Uh, NYU, joined by our Engelberg Center on Innovation Law, is delighted to be hosting this eighth session in the Hearings Initiative. Today's hearing focuses on the question of common ownership by investors and competing firms and related issues at the intersection of antitrust and corporate governance. My first order of business today is to invite our Dean, Trevor Morrison, to offer a welcome. Trevor. Uh, thank you, Scott, and, and good morning. Let me be the second uh, to welcome you all here to NYU Law. We really are thrilled uh, to be hosting this hearing of the FTC. Thanks to the FTC for joining us in this. And we certainly think that um, if a hearing is going to be held in New York, it's absolutely fitting that it be here at NYU Law. We have a great many people uh, in our community, on our faculty, engaged in the issues uh, that the FTC is engaged in. And many of them will be speaking today, including uh, Scott Hempel, Dan Rubenfeld, and Ed Rock, and of course our colleague Marcel Cahan works closely on these issues and with Scott as well. So uh, with that cohort of faculty working on these issues, we're certainly glad to be able to bring and host the FTC here uh, today. Um, and I wish you very well for this hearing. Again, welcome and thank you. Thanks, Trevor. So next, I have a couple of uh, housekeeping items. FTC staff has asked me to remind everyone that this is a public event and is being webcast, photographed, and recorded. By participating in this event, you're agreeing that your image and anything you say or submit may be posted indefinitely at ftc.gov or on one of the commission's publicly available social media sites. A transcript of today's proceedings will be posted as well. Uh, question cards will be available throughout the day. Please use them to write down questions for panelists. Staff will collect them and pass them to the moderators who may pose selected questions if time permits. Finally, if you have your mo mobile phone with you, uh, Please, uh, please silence it. So let me also echo uh, Trevor's welcome. It's particularly fitting that the session is held at NYU Law for, uh, for two reasons. The first, uh, Trevor already gave uh, you know, the school's deep engagement with some of these questions and more generally the uh, uh, role that financial services play in, as the lifeblood of New York City. The second reason that I just wanted to emphasize for a minute comes back to the late Bob Potofsky, uh, former chair of the Federal Trade Commission and a, uh, a dear friend to many of us. Today's hearing and the FTC's series of hearings more generally were inspired by Bob's desire to keep the FTC abreast of cutting edge issues in antitrust and consumer protection. Uh, Chairman Potofsky held a series of public hearings in order to advance that aim and this is very much in that tradition. Now as some of you know, uh, Bob Potofsky and NYU have a deep connection. Before Bob was a public, service, uh, public servant, he was a professor of law here at, uh, here at NYU. Bob joined our faculty in 1964 at the urging of our late colleague, the great Norman Dorson. Such was their friendship that Bob led the school's Hayes program on civil liberties while uh, Norman was on sabbatical. And uh, the favor was returned. Norman Dorson uh, filled in one year to teach Bob's antitrust class. So all of us at NYU are particularly pleased to reconnect in this way with Bob's legacy as a scholar and, uh, and as a public servant. So, as you guys have seen, we have, a full, uh, we have a full agenda today. Our first session features two sitting commissioners, one from the Federal Trade Commission and one from the Securities and Exchange Commission who will be giving uh, some remarks. So uh, first up is Noah Phillips. Commissioner Phillips was confirmed by the Senate in April. Prior to the commission, he served as chief counsel to Senator John Cornyn on the Senate Judiciary Committee and in a variety of other roles advising the senator. Prior to his Senate service, Commissioner Phillips worked at Wasserstein Perella, an investment bank, and as a, litig excuse me, and as a litigator at Crevasse, Swain, and Moore. So, uh, Commissioner Phillips, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Thank you for the kind introduction uh, and also the privacy warning. This is not our privacy hearing, but it's important that everyone think about that all the time. Um, I'm really, really thrilled to be here to open uh, today's uh, excellent uh, hearing um, and to welcome the distinguished group of scholars and market participants from whom we'll hear today. Um, I'm also very thankful uh, to NYU for hosting this event. I do think it is appropriate uh, that we are here in New York to talk about this. Um, I don't know whether Commissioner Jackson is here yet. Um, I'm very pleased uh, that he is joining us. Uh, he has spoken publicly about the need to bring competition economics to the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, and of course uh, is joining us today. My only hope is that doesn't augur some sort of like interjurisdictional power grab on the part of the SEC. Uh, we are older but we're scrappy and we don't <laughs> shy from a fight uh, so he should just know that. Um, I want to start with the traditional FTC caveat and that is the remarks that I give today are my own thoughts. Um, and don't necessarily represent the views of the commission as a whole or my fellow commissioners. Um, common ownership is an issue of particular interest to me. Um, uh, but it probably helps to just start with a little bit of a definition. Uh, last year in front of the OECD, the US antitrust agencies defined common ownership as, quote, the simultaneous ownership of stock in competing companies by a single investor where none of the stock holdings is large enough to give the owner control of any of these companies, end quote. And I want to draw an important distinction. Common ownership is distinct from cross ownership, wherein a company holds an interest in one of its competitors or other joint venture or co-partner scenarios that have long been a focus of US antitrust law. The most important thing for purposes of today about common ownership is that it is a reality of our modern economy and that it is ubiquitous. Americans are increasingly utilizing the many and diversified investment options that large institutional asset managers offer. And the advent of indexing funds has opened important avenues through which average Americans can invest their retirement savings, uh, sometimes at a low or even zero price. Um, they can also have pretty good returns. As a result of the growing demand for this popular product, trillions of dollars that these companies now manage um, are increasingly including shares of competing companies. That's a reality. <coughs> In the last few years, economists and law professors have raised the question whether common ownership is negatively affecting competition. We have a number of them here today. I see Martin Schmaltz sitting over here. Uh, his work with Jose Azar and Isabel Teku kicked off such a bevy of research and commentary that it is often simply referred to as the airlines paper. Um, I know that's not the only work, um, but it sort of um, set the ships to sea. Um, some are concerned that common ownership uh, remedies proposed uh, are quite dramatic. According to one group of scholars who are proponents of these remedies, addressing the threat of common ownership would upend, quote, the basic structure of the financial sector end quote. For example, by limiting asset managers to holding no more than 1% of a given industry unless they do so in a purely passive manner. And this debate is not just academic. Antitrust enforcers around the world are watching its development, as we are today, and incorporating common ownership into their analyses. For instance, last year, as I mentioned, the OECD held hearings on common ownership. And we've seen that European antitrust enforcers have begun citing these theories in their decisions. I find this debate particularly interesting because it takes us to the intersection of antitrust, corporate, and securities law and policy. And in a sense, historically, this is very fitting because in a way, the FTC grew out of the Bureau of Corporations at the Department of Commerce. When I spoke about this issue last in June, I noted an important way in which the intuition behind the antitrust theory of harm from common ownership runs counter to the long-standing concerns of those other bodies of law. Specifically, corporate law in particular preoccupies itself with the principal agent problem, the issue of how you get the management to work on behalf of the owners of the corporation, the shareholders. Management neglect of shareholders, and in particular of minority shareholders, is a particular concern. And the common ownership theory, or at least one version of it, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, 
is concerned that managers show too much attention uh, to shareholders, and in particular to certain minority shareholders. In June, I identified several areas of research that I, as an antitrust enforcer, would like to see developed before shifting policy on <coughs> common ownership. They were, first, how common ownership affects a broad group of industries. Second, whether a clear mechanism of harm can be identified. Third, a rationale why managers would put the interests of one set of shareholders, in particular a minority set, above the others. And finally, a rigorous weighing of the harms, of the, pro uh, the allegedly um, anti-competitive harms against all the benefits of institutional shareholding. So the first question stems from the fact that common ownership is so ubiquitous. Is it also ubiquitously causing anti-competitive harm? And if so, how? Professor Manesh Patel, from whom we'll also hear today, writes about the sensitivity of the harm theories to various factors, including the structure of a given industry. We've seen some additional research since June. One recent working paper examines common ownership and competition in the ready-to-eat cereal industry, and another looks at pay-for-delay settlements in the pharmaceutical industry. I understand that economists are continuing to analyze the impact of common ownership in other industries. These studies are critical to understanding whether, and if so, how, common ownership might dampen competition between rivals. The better the research behind our enforcement, the better our enforcement will be. So the second thing I asked about was to identify a clear mechanism of harm. Identifying the mechanism of harm, that is, how common shareholding actually causes a lessening of competition, remains a matter of robust debate. Some proponents of predicating antitrust liability on common ownership acknowledge that, quote, the theory literature to date does not identify what mechanisms funds may use to soften competition, end quote. That's Fiona Scott Morton uh, and Herbert Hovenkamp. Understanding the mechanism is, however, critical to developing a coherent legal theory of antitrust harm and ultimately to crafting an appropriate remedy. To my mind, there are in fact two competing theories of common ownership and how it might lead to anti-competitive harm. And for purposes of this discussion, I want to call them active and passive. The active theory involves managers affirmatively foregoing competition. Professor Einar L. Haig argues that the harm mechanism is less opaque than critics claim, noting that it would include all the ordinary mechanisms by which managers are incentivized to act in the interest of their shareholders. Voting, executive compensation, the market for corporate control, the stock market, and the labor market. That's his quote. He cites examples of when common ownership might impact how the common owners encourage the commonly owned firms to behave. Professors Ed Rock and Daniel Rubenfeld, from whom we'll also hear, uh, who disagree with Professor L. Haig about the remedies, offer a hypothetical of a portfolio manager who cautions airline companies not to expand capacity as they're coming out of an economic downturn. These types of active mechanisms may look like classic collusion, with which antitrust law is well familiar. And certainly where they involve active communication, the anti-competitive conduct and harm should be more easily observable. In the case of a portfolio manager on a call, literally public, they entail real-world affirmative action to which one can point, and as such, should be covered within an existing antitrust jurisprudence. While presumably not intended to deal with competition, we have seen some asset managers themselves work together to effectuate what they view as social responsibility as exemplified in recent reporting about principles for firearms dealers. The second theory of harm is what one might call the passive theory. Professor Schmaltz and others posit that because they own shares, I'm putting own in quotation marks, we'll talk about that later, because they own shares in competing firms that would all benefit from a lessening of competition, common owners do not have incentives to push their commonly owned firms to compete. Collusion of the sort contemplated in the active theory can exacerbate anti-competitive effects, but it is not required for this theory of harm to operate. This passive harm theory asserts that the common ownership harm derives from the absence of incentives from shareholders to encourage the firms in which they hold the shares to compete. 
In a sense, the anti-competitive harm asserted here is only a species of an incentive problem endemic to the economy, to the nature of the public corporation itself. As Berlin Means long ago recognized, and as I discussed in June, dispersing ownership among numerous shareholders reduces the ability and the incentive of any given shareholder to attempt to exert control, such as by pressuring a firm to compete more aggressively. This means not only common shareholders, but any dispersed shareholder may have reduced incentives to encourage the firm to compete. Professor L. Haig notes that the benefits from softened competition may also be shared more broadly among shareholders as a firm increases profits, for example, in an oligopolistic market. So while dispersed shareholders may lack an incentive to, to encourage competition in general, that may especially be the case if we can assume that they are affirmatively benefiting from oligopolistic pricing and profits. This passive theory raises a number of interesting issues in my mind. First, it appears to be in tension with some of the remedies proposed to address common ownership, which offer up, for instance, pure passivity, not my words, as a solution. If passivity itself is the problem, it can hardly be the solution as well. Second, at a time of concern about a lack of competition in the economy generally, is chilling shareholder input the right move? Should we not be considering mechanisms that would encourage companies to compete? The hart scott Rodino Act explicit, explicitly exempts from filing requirements acquisitions made, quote, solely for the purpose of investment, end quote, which the antitrust agencies have interpreted to mean as applying to purely passive shareholders. If we don't get enough encouragement to compete, is that the right approach? Years ago, Henry Manny explained that the market for corporate control helps to rectify the disparate power and incentives of firm managers and shareholders, and affords, quote, to these shareholders both power and protection commensurate with their interest in corporate affairs, end quote. Actions that undermine the effective operation of the market for corporate control, including antitrust policy that fails to consider this market, may prove harmful to investors, but also to consumers. Third, how can we identify the marginal and purportedly negative effects of common ownership where shareholders already have little incentive to encourage firms to compete more aggressively, and maybe even less than that, given the structure of a particular market, as I mentioned earlier, say an oligopolistic market? Consider liability under Section 7 of the Clayton Act, a <coughs> theory propounded in the common ownership literature, where acquisitions are only unlawful if they are likely substantially to lessen competition. At what point do the effects of a share acquisition meet that substantiality threshold? Whichever theory you subscribe to or scares you, I look forward to today's discussion of the evidence. I'd be remiss not to mention two of our hosts, Professor Hempel and Professor Marcel Kahan, who conclude thusly with regard to the mechanisms of harm. This is a quote, and it's long, so forgive me. First, several mechanisms in the literature are not, in fact, empirically tested. Second, some mechanisms are ineffective in raising portfolio value or would pose major implementation problems for CCOs, common concentrated owners. Third, because most institutional CCOs have only weak incentives to increase portfolio value, they are likely not to benefit from pursuing mechanisms that carry significant reputational costs or legal liability, end quote. Third, my third question from June, was asking for a rationale regarding managers' responsiveness to certain shareholders, and apparently certain shareholders over others. This is another context where the assumptions underlying common ownership run up against assumptions underlying other legal regimes, specifically corporate and securities law. If the principal agent problem concerns you, and you think about shareholder neglect, or put a little differently, maybe, too little competition. Understanding how shareholders and managers behave is critical to ensuring that we have coherent legal regimes that accurately capture harmful behavior and encourage beneficial behavior. Common ownership presumes that managers are very particularly attuned to the desires of a minority of their shareholders and act to maximize value to them. Whereas corporate law assumes that managers, unless forced to behave otherwise, will act to maximize their own interests over that of shareholders generally. 
and of minority shareholders specifically. So in a real sense, corporate law tends to worry very much that managers will not be responsive enough to their shareholders, while common ownership theories presume loyalty to select a few, often passive, investors. Professors Azar and El Haig point to modeling demonstrating that if managers seek to maximize expected shares of votes or likelihood of being reelected, then they will seek to maximize the weighted average of their shareholders' profits from all their shareholdings. This model also demonstrates that shareholder variation in levels of common ownership will alter the precise weight managers put on each shareholder. But skeptics have raised questions as to the practical application um, and real world predictability of such models. Are managers so acutely attuned to the shareholding levels and desires of their various shareholders? Do they respond in a precise fashion to those changing shareholder levels and desires? Do boards and senior managers of major companies even get involved in deciding issues like pricing? As noted earlier, common ownership theory proponents have responded in part that non-common shareholders might likewise benefit from softer competition. And so managers are not actually acting against the interest of most holders. <coughs> but again, if all or most shareholders benefit from soft competition, such that none have incentives to actively encourage a firm to be more aggressive in competition, what additional impact does common ownership make? Much of this comes down to what shareholder and manager incentives actually are. There are reasons why shareholders might prefer softer competition in certain circumstances, but there are also reasons why they might not. For instance, if they are diversified across industries as investors and customers to those setting oligopoly prices, they might not always benefit from oligopoly pricing in discrete industries. The answer can only be complex. Measuring those harms against the gains to those shareholders from softening competition. What's an asset manager to do? To the extent the answers are in fact nuanced, different shareholders with different perspectives, different preferences, different incentives changing over time, to the corporate manager, isn't competition the safest and most legal bet? Another issue. In my remarks thus far, I've been a little bit irresponsible about using words like own. Some are investment advisors or investment managers are beneficial owners, but are not the economic owners of the shares. Professors Hempel and Kahan criticized the empirical literature to date as paying insufficient attention to the systematic differences in the incentives of different investor types. They find that the empirical literature fails to take account of the possibility that investor types are likely, uh, investor types likely to be CCOs, those, those are the common concentrated owners, have systematically lower incentives to get involved than investor types likely to be non-concentrated owners. They explain that while the literature assumes the common owner's objective is to raise portfolio value, the archetypal CEO, the investment advisor, has incentives quite unlike those of an individual who holds the ownership stakes, end quote, and has only weak incentives to increase portfolio value. Consider an index fund where your goal is to sort of track the index you're, oh, and lower fees. You're not necessarily looking for higher returns than that. How do these facts factor in? Finally, in June, I asked for a rigorous weighing of the pro-competitive effects of institutional shareholding. Several scholars debating common ownership have acknowledged that various proposals would alter, quote, the basic structure of the financial sector, end quote, and transform the landscape of institutional investing. Such tectonic policy shifts should not be undertaken lightly. Large institutional investors have, in many ways, made investing affordable for the average American. Index funds, for instance, as I said earlier, sometimes have nominal to no fees. And the returns are nothing at which to laugh. Such investing opportunities were unheard of before the second half of the 20th century. When considering policies that could find index funds as they exist today are fundamentally incompatible with the antitrust laws, we need to keep these very real benefits in mind. Many Americans simply do not have the funds available to buy into more expensive investment options. Scholars have also historically placed great hope in large sophisticated institutional investors to have the incentives to make corporate governance better. Are they doing so? I look forward to hearing about stewardship practices today 
and how their development should be considered in this context. Uh, John Bogle, the inventor of the index fund, wrote last week about his concern that too few people control corporate governance in America. Are those concerns valid? And how should they factor in at all to what we're talking about here? This common ownership discussion has remained vigorous since I last had the opportunity to speak about it in June. <coughs> and I am really heartened to see the serious scholarship continue to examine the theories and empirics at play, uh, and very pleased that the FTC uh, has included this topic in our hearings. Our panelists today will grapple, will grapple with a number of very intriguing questions, and I'm excited to hear from them all. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Phillips. Our next speaker is uh, my good friend and colleague, Robert Jackson, who was sworn in in January as Commissioner of the Securities and Exchange Commission. He comes to the commission from right here at NYU Law, where he's a professor of law on leave. I can't resist noting here the deep connection between the SEC and these FTC hearings. As uh, Bob Potofsky, who I mentioned before, <coughs> liked to explain, it was a series of FTC hearings like these that led to the creation of the SEC. Previously, Commissioner Jackson served as a senior policy advisor to the Department of the Treasury. Earlier in his career, uh, Commissioner Jackson practiced law at Wachtell Lipton and Katz. Uh, Commissioner Jackson. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, to my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Hemphill, and, and to all my friends here at uh, NYU and at the Federal Trade Commission for hosting these uh, very important conversations. Um, it's really a privilege uh, to be back here uh, at NYU and speaking before the FTC. And I share the commitment that everybody brings here this morning to make sure our markets are competitive and fair for all Americans. Now, when I give a speech like this, I'm supposed to give a caveat, which is that these are my views, not the views of anybody else at the SEC. But I don't even work at the FTC, so I should give the further caveat of the total irrelevance of my views. However, I want to point out that it's been my experience that just given enough time and wisdom, all my colleagues at the SEC figure out I was right all along. That never happens. So one of the things that's important to begin here is with some history, which as Professor Hemphill alluded to, back in the 1933 and 19, at the adoption of the 33 and 34 Acts, the 33 Act used to be enforced by this agency. Famously, the Securities Division at the FTC first implemented the securities laws before the creation of my agency in 1934. And um, that's why the FTC is in a very real way, in an important way, both historically and intellectually, the birthplace of the SEC. So it's good to be home. I remarked in a recent speech about the fundamental analytical mistake we've been making in American securities markets. To assume that we at the SEC can regulate our capital markets without thinking through the effects of those choices on competition. Uh, I said there, and I believe this morning, that the FTC and SEC should be working more closely together so we can better oversee these markets and the exact kind of issues we're discussing today. In fact, the subject of today's hearing, in my judgment, which is really competition and consumer protection in the 21st century, highlights the compelling need for this close collaboration. And I hope my appearance today marks the beginning of that partnership. Now, the subject of today's hearing, and you'll hear about evidence all morning, is whether institutional investors, and primarily passive index funds, uh, that hold large stakes in uh, uh, American public companies can decrease competition and raise prices for consumers. It's a critical debate on which I'll explain my view shortly. But I've come here today to urge all of you to think about common ownership and the subject we'll discuss today uh, and identify it for what it is, which is an investor protection problem a corporate governance problem. In my judgment, we're at a pivotal moment in American financial history when corporate elections are increasingly decided by a handful of exceptionally powerful index fund managers. And what's clear to me is that the SEC's current rules leave investors largely in the dark about how institutional investors are wielding that considerable authority. And I'm here today to call on my colleagues at the SEC to pursue rules that will take advantage of existing data on institutional voting to empower investors with more and better information on how their money is voted in American cor corporate elections. More on that in a moment, but let me begin with the common ownership debate. 
First of all, for anybody who believes, as I do, that all good research scholars have an obligation to seek policy impact in their work, today's hearing is an enormous victory. Because we're here, of course, because of exceptionally important and thoughtful scholarship by my friends in the academy who've done work that has taught me a great deal that I didn't know about the relationship between common ownership and competition. Of course, the seminal piece is by uh, Jose Azar, Martin Schmaltz, uh, and Isabel Tico. An extraordinary recent paper in the Journal of Finance that demonstrates a relationship between measures of common ownership and uh, price increases in the airline industry. And of course, Professor Elhag has incredibly thoughtfully moved the debate forward, examining the ways in which we should be thinking about those data for the enforcement of the antitrust laws. I commend that work to all of you. And as a researcher, I can only admire the enormous uh, scholarly and policy impact that that research has had. My own reaction to the work is that it presents us with a puzzle, and that we're at the beginning, not the end, of our conversation about common ownership and what to do about it. And let me say why. First of all, my NYU colleagues, Professors Hempel and Kahan, in a recent paper, explained the difficulty with using the measures set forth in that scholarship for evaluating the questions we're discussing today, in particular the MHHI measure and the MHHI Delta measure um, employed in those papers. And there's two things that I want to highlight in the Hempel Kahan paper that I commend to all of you that to me sets the agenda for moving forward with scholarly work on common ownership. First, as Professors Hempel and Kahan explain, there are a number of different strategies that, one, uh, that an institutional investor might pursue in connection with the reduction of competition in their portfolio companies. One is to eliminate competition within a particular, or reduce competition within a particular firm in an industry, permitting rent extraction for other firms and the total value of the portfolio to rise. Another is to restrict production across the industry, permitting rent extraction across all firms in the industry. And the crucial thing to see that Professors Hempel and Kahan point out is that these are two very, very different strategies from the point of view of an undiversified investor. That is, one will meet with approval from that undiversified investor, and another will be resisted. To the degree that those two strategies reflect completely different ways of thinking about the impact of common ownership on competition, or I should say, the potential impact, we need new scholarship that studies the difference between those strategies, in particular that looks for cases where an undiversified owner of the firm will resist the purported anti-competitive instincts of the diversified owners. As Professors Hempel and Kahan point out, we don't yet have that paper. We don't yet have scholarship that tackles that. And indeed, as they point out, I think very importantly, the MHHI measure itself is not designed to test that hypothesis. No, instead, we need new scholarship with new measures that test that particular difference in those two strategies to see whether or not we actually have hard evidence of this kind of activity in American industry. But much more importantly for my purposes, as Professors Kahan and Hempel point out, and as my colleagues Dan Rubenfeld and Ed Rock have also pointed out in an important paper this year in the Antitrust Journal, Law Journal, there's very little evidence so far about the precise mechanism by which such activity might take place. There's a great deal of speculation about how this might occur. And I find the preliminary evidence on that subject extremely interesting. In particular, uh, Professor Schmaltz, along with a group of co-authors, has a recent paper on the use of relative performance uh, 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 measures, relative performance compensation-based incentives that may or may not contribute to competition in an industry. Now, as someone who has studied executive compensation for many years, I would love to think that it's that important to competition in American industry. Indeed, I'm biased to believe that a change in managers' relative incentives could affect price setting across American industries, because otherwise I've been wasting my life. <laughs> but I'm unpersuaded by the evidence we have so far, and here's why. Changes in incentives at the top of the house in an American public company can have many, many effects, and I'm inclined to believe it can work throughout the organization to have an effect on price setting, but we don't yet have hard evidence that it does so. 
And I would want to understand the organizational design and the differences from industry to industry in the price setting authority throughout a firm to better comprehend how changes in relative performance incentives could have an effect on prices. Now, whatever you think of this evidence, as I said earlier, in my view, we are at the beginning, not the end of the debate on concentrated common ownership. And I took um, uh, with great interest a careful look at the work of Eric Posner, Fiona Scott Morton, and uh, uh, Glenn Weil with respect to potential proposals to limit diversification or to regulate institutional investors in order to address the issues in this literature. And I must tell you, as somebody who's sworn to protect investors, my sense is that the literature we have today does not carry the heavy burden that a commissioner sworn to protect investors should demand in order to impose limitations on diversified investment in American public companies. I say that for many reasons, but most importantly because diversified holdings have delivered an enormously important product to American families who are saving for retirement and education. These are the savings I'm sworn to protect. And to restrict their diversification would impose costs upon them that are potentially enormous. Also, as Professors Rock and Rubenfeld pointed out, we wouldn't have even begun to contemplate the effects of such a rule on other industries that common ownerships might own, uh, that, that, that uh, concentrated common owners might own. For example, if we think about the airline industry, we need to begin to think about limits on diversification in their suppliers, in others who um, uh, play a role in the distribution or consumption of, uh, um, of airline activity. And all of these knock-on effects, to my mind, have not yet been sufficiently considered for me to be supportive of a rule that would restrict diversification in American investment. But my concern about those proposals is not so much that their burden has not been met. I don't think it has. I think we're at the beginning of a conversation that might someday lead to sufficient evidence in that respect. But we're not yet uh, at a place where I would be comfortable with such a resolution. Whatever you think about that, my concern is that it's distracting us from the actual issue we should discuss today. To me, the particular the issue that deserves and demands more attention than it's received, both at the FTC and at my agency, is the fact that today institutional investors cast votes in corporate elections on behalf of more than 100 million American families. They wield enormous influence on the future of our companies and our communities. But we're not giving investors nearly enough information about how their money is being voted. And because of that, American investors can't make choices among index funds about the way that they carry out those duties. And it's time for that to change. Now, the shareholder vote, we all understand well, is a critical tool in setting governance policies of companies and holding management accountable for their actions. And that's why another series of recent papers that I believe you'll hear about later today, in my view, deserve as much attention as the common concentrated ownership scholarship you'll also be talking about. In particular, Professor John Coates, my corporate law professor, a fact for which he will never fully be forgiven, has a recent paper identifying what he calls the problem of 12. It's an extraordinary paper in that it makes a very simple point. Actually, it's the rare empirical paper that confesses that it just picked a number out of thin air. <laughs> Coates' point is not that there's actually 12 people who control corporate America. It's that that number is a realistic, reasonable ballpark of the number of people who make decisions about the future of American corporations. And he worries about the credibility of any securities market, any uh, product market, where that much power is wielded by that few people, and so do I. Professor Coates identifies a number of particular uh, potential resolutions of that problem. I'll discuss them in a moment. But what he knows, because he's been thinking about agency problems for a very long time, is that the, what, what's happened here is in a search for holding corporate management accountable, we have transferred the potential for agency problems from corporate management to institutional investors who now wield the extraordinary authority that Coates describes in his paper. Indeed, with all respect to Professor Coates, his insight is not new. My friends at Columbia, Ron Gilson and Jeff Gordon, years ago uh, published a paper, The Agency Cost of Agency Capitalism, that pointed out increasingly the role of institutional investors in deciding about the agenda items that are set by other less diversified, more activist investors. 
And since the publication of that article in the Columbia Law Review a few years ago, that problem has grown more, not less, relevant uh, to policy debates in corporate law. Now, the question is, what should we do about it? And for me, the clearest path forward is set by another recent paper that I commend for all of you. I'm giving you a lot of homework, I realize. <laughs> another recent paper by my friends Ryan Bubb and Emiliano Catan of NYU. This is an extraordinary piece that takes years of data disclosed at form NPX, uh, over more than a decade since that form um, uh, became effective at the SEC, and shows the party structure of mutual fund voting. What Bob and Catan demonstrate is that we can use standard models of political decision making to understand the various ways that institutional investors vote. They offer a model that distributes those votes across three different parties of um, uh, of uh, institutional investors, the managerialist party, the shareholder intervention party, and the shareholder veto party. Now one thing about the Bum and Catan paper that is so striking is that we didn't know it before. That is for years, institutional investors have been putting billions of dollars of American family savings to work in pursuit of those choices. And we just now have learned the way that they're making them. And that's why today I'm calling on my colleagues at the SEC to put forth new rules that would require better disclosure of information just like that. Now you might say to me, oh Rob, um, we don't need new rules, it's already in Form NPX. And I would invite you to read one and try to do the difficult work an investor must do in the United States today to try to understand both at the fund level and at the portfolio family level the way that votes are cast. My sense is that Ryan and Emiliano can tell you stories of many late nights spent trying to decipher this form. Whatever you think about that, what I'd say is it's our job at the SEC to make more clear the ways that institutional investors are discharging their obligations to the people that they're voting for. And I'm happy to say it's my impression that most large institutions agree. After all, Larry Fink each year publishes a clear view about what he plans to do in discharging that responsibility. You can go to Vanguard or Fidelity's website, they'll tell you all about what they plan to do. And my call today is for us to put that information in front of American retail investors when they put their money down. In my view, at the moment when a retail investor makes the decision to be in a particular mutual fund family, to use a particular ind index product, they should have an understanding of how their money will be voted. You might be inclined to say they won't care First of all, that is, I love to say this since it gives me papers to write, an empirical question. But even if it weren't, I ask all of you to keep in mind the enormously powerful ex-ante effects of a disclosure regime of this kind. The notion that someday a retail investor at the point of sale will be given salient, relevant information of the kind in the above Catan paper might get institutional investors thinking a little more about which party they belong to and why. The ex-ante benefits of this kind of disclosure were the basis for the 33 and 34 X. And the notion that American retail investors won't read all this so it doesn't matter, in my view, is with all respect mistaken. What I'm interested in is providing institutional investors with the knowledge before they cast those votes that they're going to have to tell people in salient, clear terms how they are voting Americans' money. For me, that is a path to real accountability for those institutional investors and a beginning of an answer to Professor Coates' challenge about what to do about the concentrated power that institutional investors wield in the United States. Let me conclude by saying how important I think today's conversation is, and I feel very fortunate to be here, because this is exactly the way policy should be made in the United States. We should have researchers, like Professor Schmaltz and Professor L. Haig, put on the table important new questions that we haven't thought enough about, offer policy solutions. We should debate whether they're right or wrong for the people of the United States. We should demand better evidence when we need it. And we should be willing to act when we have it. And in my view, what we know now about institutional investors in the United States is that they wield a tremendous amount of influence over the future of the economy in this country. And as a result, we need to do better about the ways in which we hold them accountable for those decisions. So thanks so much to my colleagues at NYU and at the FTC for holding these important hearings and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much.
finish their colloquy here. Uh, Commissioner Phillips, uh, any reactions to uh, Professor Jackson's remarks that you want to? Uh, I think my, my most important reaction is he should send me the Catan paper, which I haven't yet read. I think we can arrange that. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Professor Catan is here. Actually, we should we should just, in, in the interest of full disclosure, tell them. Uh, actually, um, Noah leaned over and said, "I knew you were going to try and grab power <laughs> from the FTC." He's right. Things were good in 1933. <laughs> they ruined everything in 34. No, um, I thought it was a, a, a fascinating speech. Um, I think uh, I was struck that uh, Commissioner Jackson and I, uh, in many respects, with respect to common ownership, see things uh, somewhat similarly. I think we see similar um, kind of tensions in the liter literature, similar kinds of questions to ask. Both of us agree. Uh, that um, we need to see more research. Um, we're both very grateful uh, uh, for everyone being here and for this debate going on. Uh, I absolutely agree um, that this is a better way to make policy in the United States. Um, at the very end of my remarks, I alluded to um, the column that followed on the Coates paper uh, by John Bogle. I think that's, those, those are very interesting questions as well. Professor Jackson, any reaction to... Uh Professor Phillips, or to, or to the Wall Street Journal commentary from a few days ago? I'll throw that in, too. Uh, so uh, uh, I thought um, Bogle was exactly right. Um, and it's really striking from an historical point of view to see this from the inventor of, of the index fund. You know, my, my own view is that the problem that we have, which is that index investing has become so popular as to raise this debate is what one might think of as a first class problem. I mean, we have delivered an enormously valuable product to American investors that has paid for untold millions of retirements, educations, incredibly uh, important. This is the way that the American people access the growth in our economy. So it's an enormously important product. It's become so powerful, so popular, so ubiquitous that we need to talk about the ways in which those who vote that money are abiding that responsibility. That, that seems to me the right place to be for the conversation. I think we also need to be very wary of the emerging evidence that there might be an anti-competitive effect here. Because to the degree that that case gets fully proved, I think we do need to have a conversation about making sure that American industry is sufficiently competitive. Um, so I continue to watch with interest as that uh, literature evolves. But my own judgment is that we're at the beginning rather than the end of that conversation as a matter of optimal policy. Well, I think with that, I'm going to uh, thank both of our. Well, do, you want to, do you want to take questions from folks? Sure. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions from people. Yes. Uh, I guess we'll need a microphone. Well, if you have questions, uh, you should set them out on a question card. We can send a lot of pictures of that slide. And I can repeat it, depending. Yeah. Hi. This was a question posed to Commissioner Jackson. Yeah. Right. So um, it's a good question. Um, so, so let me say a few things about this. First of all, because I was diving into the above Catan paper, I, I spent some time in Form NPX. First of all, just as a matter of like human advice, don't. <laughs> like, don't do that with your time. But, um, but what I found is that it already contains some of the information. Like, this is why I think the, 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 the policy shift here is one that makes sense. It's a very rich set of detail. You can get a lot out of it. It's just incomprehensible. Um, and so a lot of the things you're talking about, for example, incentive structure, portfolio family structure, the way people are voting uh, across the organization, if you work hard enough, it's there. Um, so my answer to your question is yes. I think those things can and should be more summarily disclosed. 
And my case for this, um, uh, for, for, for moving forward with such a rule, is that the information is already being produced in the largest institutional investors. My guess would be that the marginal cost of producing it in a summary, more digestible fashion in the way that the Bub Katan paper presents it would not be costly. Um, now, we can have a debate over the benefits of that, whether or not it would move the needle. I'm happy to have that conversation, but my answer to your question is yes, and moreover, um, I don't think it would be marginally as costly as everyone might imagine to make that information more accessible to American investors. Can I just add one thing to that? To me, and I, I, have not, I haven't read the Bob Catan paper. I haven't looked at any one of these forms in my life. How dare you? <laughs> I have read 10Ks and 10Qs. Um, the, this is a species of a long-standing, ongoing discussion about how the provision of information, the mandatory provision of information, uh, the amount of information, the medium of its communication, and critically for purposes of Commissioner Jackson's remarks, the timing of the disclosure information empower shareholders, but also consumers to make decisions in the market. Where you have information out there, there are times where um, it can very easily be reflected in let's say, a liquid capital market. Um, this is something we are grappling with now uh, with Congress uh, in the context of privacy, right? Everyone here is familiar with the fact that you get little pop-up notices that tell you how the website you're visiting is going to use your information. Raise your hand if you've read one. Okay, and this is a very well-educated group of people. So we all believe in markets, and we all believe in the capacity um, of markets to help allocate resources efficiently. Um, markets require information. And so some of the most vexing questions that we face is how best to feed that, into, that information into those mar markets. It's a question of how shares are voted in elections. It's a question of the financials of companies, right? That's the 33 Act and the 34 Act, was the 33 Act. Um, it's, it's a question in privacy. It's a broader issue. Um, and you know, it's good to look at these questions um, and keep up to date on how consumers, whether they be consumers of investments or consumers elsewhere in the market, uh, assimilate information. So one question uh, from the audience. Could, you, could, could each of you all say a little bit more? This is about a question about passive versus active. Uh, could you all say a little more about you know, the kind of fundamental differences between passive investors and active investors for, you know, for, for I think for both of these sets of issues that are on the table. Maybe we'll start with you, Professor Phillips. Sure, and since back to I, uh, that was my nomenclature, so I guess I'm responsible for it. It shows um, up in the literature, too, to some degree. Um, so to me, the critical distinction, uh, or one critical distinction, has to do with if you believe that common ownership may present uh, a competition problem, or even if you simply believe that it's a problem um, for purposes of competition that all sorts of folks, uh, whether they be common owners or otherwise, don't have adequate incentive to spur firm management to compete. To me, you need to think about what are the mechanisms for spurring that competition? Um, who are uh, the right people to do it? Um, I think, you know, as I mentioned, uh, we need to look at the various ways in which we approach, I'm, I'm gonna stick in competition policy lane, um, the ways we approach competition policy and always be thinking about, will this chill that kind of input from shareholders? Um, or will it help shareholders encourage firms to compete? That is a really important dynamic in the market. Uh, it's important for purposes of large asset managers. It's important for purposes of smaller activist investors. Um, it's important across the board. Um, so I think to me the remedy question um, is really, really important. And also, as I said before, to me there is a big distinction. If you subscribe to the active theory, you support one kind of remedy. If you subscribe to the passive theory, the stay passive doesn't really look very attractive as a remedy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rob? So I'll take the question in a slightly different direction and talk about this, the distinction more broadly in the capital markets between what we're calling activist and passive in, in investors, um, as opposed to a particular theory about, about the behavior of concentrated common owners. You know, for me, um, 
It's been fascinating to watch over the last decade the increasingly blurred lines between what someone calls an active and passive uh, investor. And I'm quite sure that um, of all the people who could decide what the difference is, I'm least qualified to dictate to the marketplace what it means to be truly active. Let me, let me say why. Um, you hear a lot about activist investors and the things we might do or not do. You know, I'm not sure who people mean when they focus on activists in particular, but if what they mean is people who are thoughtfully engaged in the governance of public companies, you could very well include index fund managers who are voting their shares. Um, and indeed, I think the point that the um, Gordon and Gilson paper made years ago is that there's this important interaction we don't fully understand between these two types of investors. Activists play an important role in agenda setting in a way that passive investors might not. But the crucial decision about who wins is often left to those institutional investors because they carry such sway with respect to votes at large public companies. In fact, if you talk to any activist, they'll tell you, and the data are beginning to make this clear, that <coughs> what dictates their, the success of their strategy, and I suspect increasingly the targets that they choose, is the degree to which they feel they can persuade those institutions, those passive institutions, that they are right. And so for me, the, the interaction between these two types of investors is one that hasn't been um, studied as thoroughly as it could, especially empirically. I think the Gordon Gilson paper gives us a good set of testable propositions. I think it's time to test them because my own sense is that we call one group activist, we call another group passive. Um, but it, and I understand fundamentally the difference is that for a passive investor, the sort of comp the components of the index are dictated to them by the index provider. But I think it's not a, it's a distinction increasingly without a difference when we think about who's really wielding power in American corporate elections. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I take a step back just for a minute? Uh, both of y'all in your remarks have you know, kind of identified a, a, an ambitious agenda, partly an, an ambitious agenda for research, for further work, especially by uh, empiricists to try to make sense of some of these issues. Is there anything that you all see the agencies doing to play a role? I mean, both the SEC and the FTC have you know, uh, both you know, fact-finding capabilities and also uh, strong internal research teams. I just wonder if you, either of y'all could reflect a little bit on uh, whether it's more data, whether it's more analytical work, internal to you all. I mean, setting the agenda for the rest of us is awesome. I'm just wondering, you know, what about y'all? Is there- Sufficient is, is, too. Yeah, right, it's sufficient too, right, right. Is there, you know, how much of a role is there to play? What might that look like? I mean, either to, of you have thoughts about that? Well, I'm gonna take this as the softball that you didn't intend. Um, to me, this is the start of it, right? So today we're going to sit here and we're going to listen to the best minds in America uh, on a variety of different but interrelated topics, talk about the state of the art in research, what are the questions that are unanswered, where is their agreement. Um, uh, you know, Commissioner Jackson's call for sort of other metrics would be a great example of that. Um, this is a good way of highlighting those areas and aiming those resources. Um, you know, there are certain authorities at our disposal. Um, I will tell you there are many people who think we should use authorities to study a great many of topics and, you know, we have to be somewhat measured. But I think this, convening folks, um, bringing it to the public, inviting in the conversation, and inviting criticism back and forth, which I hope is what we see today, um, is precisely the way to start. I think we will see some of that today. Oh, yeah, man, you're going to get that for sure. So. Um, <laughs> So I, here, here's what I, I would say. I think one thing that I have suggested in past remarks, and um, you know, um, the chairman at the SEC and I have talked about it, and I hope we'll continue the conversation about it, is um, joint research work between our two agencies. Um, not only because of the historical mandate that we share, um, but because fundamentally these questions can't be tackled with the data that one or both. And increasingly, frankly, when I talk to the research economists at the FTC and in, in, our, in our house, um, they have sort of um, uh, very different data and perspectives on these questions. And so I would like very much for us to be considering joint work in the area. Um, I think um, putting together a task force um, of, of uh, researchers on, on it, both agencies is something worth considering because you're not wrong, Scott, that you know, we gave you guys a lot of homework today. And, um, I, by the way, I should confess my conflict. I might be one day a guy who will do that homework, so it's like, yeah. I mean, 
providing supply for my own, because it's complicated. Anyway, um, I, I, I guess my view is that you're right to push us and say, there's got to be something that the agencies can do in terms of setting out an agenda, roundtables, et cetera, where we can um, uh, do some in-house work ourselves. And I think, that's, um, I think that's something we ought to give a lot of thought to. So a, a question from the audience. It's a question about um, how to get a more active, uh, aggressive corporate governance, I think. So are there regulatory, or what are the kind of most important regulatory or legal barriers? This, I mean, I think the premise of the question is that a more active corporate governance uh, uh, would be attractive. What are the regulatory or legal uh, barriers to that? Well, you know, I, I talked a little bit uh, in my speech about an issue at which uh, I'm beginning to look, which is the impact of Hart-Scott-Rodino. Um, Hart-Scott-Rodino is a mechanism to deal with antitrust issues. Um, it doesn't go beyond that. Um, I think we need to look at uh, mechanisms that exist in the market that are either intended to um, or have the effect of chilling um, shareholder input. I think that's a really important principle of which we can't lose sight. Um, that, as I've said in the past, and I sort of reiterate today, this to me has to be part of the weighing of the common ownership issue, which is, I mean, antitrust liability is a very powerful thing. You know, it's in civil lawsuits, trouble <coughs> damages. Um, the, the remedies from antitrust actions can be severe, and some of the remedies that are proposed for common ownership um, by some of uh, the proponents of the theory uh, are admittedly, um, would have a drastic impact. Um, and I think uh, once you, you know, if you're talking about antitrust, you're going to chill the conduct um, that you're looking at. Um, and that needs to be part of that weighing that I mentioned. That's why I called for a rigorous weighing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, ways to have more active corporate, corporate governance. How much time do you have? <laughs> yeah, I have ideas about that. <clears throat> uh, so a few things. So first of all, um, it's important to begin by understanding the fundamental economics that an institutional investor faces when they think about engaging. And Lucian Bebchuk and Scott Hurst have a terrific um, pair of papers where they walk through the incentives that institutional investors have or don't have. Um, and the, 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 sh the short version that we've understood for some time now is that um, making those investments and engagement is expensive. Um, it's very hard to cover the scope of companies that they must when they, when they have a, the kind of portfolio that they do. They're making those investments. Um, you can see that in the corporate governance teams at the very large institutions. Um, I've spent time with those teams. They're doing good work, but it's an enormous task that they face. And for me, my goal as a regulator is always to reduce the marginal cost of them doing that work. So I want to make sure that we give them the disclosure that they need, to get the information that they want to cast those votes. That's why, for example, I pushed so hard to finish the disclosure rules on executive compensation and corporate governance under Dodd-Frank. That statute's eight years old. We haven't finalized the majority of those rules. That's information that institutional investors have to go out on their own to get. It costs them money on the margin to do that. It makes them less likely to be actively engaged in corporate governance. It's just, like, it's, it's, um, it's just a fact. Uh, also, I think we should be looking at other ways to reward institutional um, investors and make it possible for them to access channels of engaging uh, with the company. So just to, 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 uh, uh, to give an example, um, there's increasingly proxy access proposals that have been adopted to public companies that provide some realistic path for, um, uh, for institutional investors to um, actually have a contested election uh, at a public company. Um, I really feel like the, the case for the universal proxy proposal that was put forth at the SEC before the new um, uh, before the new administration took place. It's very powerful. Um, and uh, like Commissioner Phillips, this, these, to me, these things are all related. Um, because he's right. To the degree you say that um, we're worried about antitrust, not only do the basic economics of institutional investing make it difficult for these folks to engage on the margin, but it raises the specter of too much engagement producing liability under the antitrust laws, uh, which I worry deters very beneficial oversight of corporate management. So it does the homework that y'all have given us potentially do that a little bit, right? I mean, should we be worried about institutional investors uh, turning tail because, look, you know, we're, we're talking through the possibility that we've had this walking antitrust violation for some time, the cure to which is to do less governance? Oh, for sure. That, uh, so that's, I mean, how, how, how strongly should we take that? I think that's a very real cost. I, th I think 
um, those who have advanced those proposals have acknowledged that cost, that there is some downside to raising the specter of antitrust liability because the, to the degree you get too much engagement from an institutional investor, it provides evidence of, um, of that kind of influence that, that might um, raise questions from an antitrust point of view. Um, and as a scholar of corporate governance, um, I, I worry about, here's what I want to say. I don't want to go too far down the road of a false choice because we can empower institutional investors to engage and act um, and still be mindful of and pay close attention to the degrees to which they use those channels or don't use those channels to reduce competition. Um, I don't think we have to choose between effective corporate governance and reduce competition in the United States. Um, but I do worry, and here's my real frustration, there are ready tools at our disposal, provide better disclosure on executive pay, finish the rules that we've got, do universal proxy. There are ready tools that would allow us to do that, and I think it's time for us to, at the SEC to start taking that seriously. So another question from the audience. Uh, I might need a little bit of help just clarifying it. Um, so I think the question is essentially about who are, like, who are these people that are voting the shares? I think just trying to get educated yeah. on you know, how many people are actually voting these institutional uh, investors' shares? Who are they within the organization? I think just try to get a little bit more educated about that. So not to uh, step on what Commissioner Jackson was saying, I think part of what he was pointing out is this is an area where we, be, we are beginning to learn a little bit more. We're beginning to learn about the dynamic. I expect that we are going to hear today some description of like at-large institutional asset managers, how stewardship works, mm -hmm. like what that process actually is. Yeah, I think that's right. And actually, just to point out a really interesting and important dynamic, um, even in the empirical literature, I mentioned the, the Bob Catan paper, there, there's a debate about the right unit of measurement for casting votes. Should it occur at the fund family, at the portfolio level, the fund family level? There's another paper that um, uh, takes a different approach for all kinds of interesting reasons. Just to give you a sense, these are brand new, cutting edge, emerging papers that are debating at what level are these votes cast. So that's why I say we're sort of at the beginning of the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, also, by the way, Scott, I would predict heterogeneity among institutions mm -hmm. with respect to the kind of group that they put together. Who actually wields power in that group? Is it the portfolio manager? Is it someone just above them in the organizational hierarchy? Is it, you know, I, I, I think my understanding when I talk to people is that there's heterogeneity even with respect to that authority. Mm -hmm. And that's something that the literature is just now beginning to understand. Mm -hmm. it, and to, to me, just to add one thing, um, this was alluded to earlier, there are also players outside of the institutional asset managers themselves, right? There are other investors who may communicate with them. Uh, there are proxy advisors. There is a broader universe of folks involved in that kind of decision making. Man, I just want to point out, we got down to six minutes left and almost made it without mentioning ISS. I was like, so whole, I, I'm still waiting <laughs> for the day where I do something on it. And we, yeah, that's right. There are other players in this ecosystem. It's worth, worth thinking and talking about them. We're having it actually at the SEC, to my, uh, the chairman's great credit, we had a really interesting roundtable discussion of those issues a couple of weeks ago. And I think, uh, I really think my colleagues on the commission are thinking hard about, um, uh, about these questions, which is why it's such a good moment for a conversation like today's. So uh, one other question from the audience, I think, is you know, picking up the theme of heterogeneity that you guys were just talking about and wanting to focus attention for a minute on uh, index fund managers, right? Uh, diversified portfolio, across, not just within an industry, but public companies in an industry, uh, but across industries, you know, in some sense approximating the whole economy. So the question is whether uh, we should really worry about index funds to the extent that they own you know, not just the competitors, but also the suppliers, and also, you know, to some degree, depending, the, you know, the customers. How does that change how we think, if it does? How does it change how we think about that kind of institutional investor? Well, to me, especially for purposes of the antitrust discussion, this is part of the nuance into which we have to get. Um, you know, I think, take a hostile merger, right? Um, if you, worry about you know, too much power invested in an institution generally for purposes along the line of Coates and Vogel's argument. If you worry about antitrust liability, um, part of what you may have in mind is the notion that the asset manager just thinks generally or about itself broadly. Take a contest where the shares are held in companies that don't have a shared interest. How are they being voted? 
right? Are they being voted the same way? Because if they're, being, if they're voting against themselves, they're operate, they, they may not be operating in the way that we might think of someone who just owns a lot of shares voting unilaterally. I think, <coughs> I think those dynamics and those nuances are critical to understand. The leveling of the sort of supply chain that you not only have an interest in one company, but in the companies from which that company buys and the companies to, to which that company sells, that is another level of nuance um, in terms of understanding what the sort of broad asset manager interest might be. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, one of the, I mean, look, this is why the, the Azar and, uh, uh, and the LA papers are so interesting and important because, you know, when I begin to try to think through, if, if, if you're an institutional investor and you want to reduce competition, how do you think about that across your entire portfolio, not just in the industry? How do you think about suppliers, customers, et cetera? Um, it, it's an enormously complicated calculus. And it, it's not, one of the things that the, the literature has done for me is clarify what the objective function might be in that situation, what they might be trying to do. So what we, what we could meaningfully put on the left-hand side um, in terms of, um, what, they're, what the institutions might be trying to achieve. Look, I, th I think he's right that um, it's, it's a good thing to start with understanding the various uh, calculus that one might do if they exercise that influence. Um, uh, and then I think, as, as your paper points out, what we really want is to make sure we have a measure that tests that strategy. Um, and I think that's where the literature, I hope, is going. Um, and the more recent paper on uh, relative performance incentives, I think, takes a big step in that direction. Make, really has given me a lot of food for thought about, okay, now if the, that helps me understand what the thesis might be, right? Because these guys are paid for exceptional within industry performance, so maybe that's a, a mechanism we can, we can think through. So um, understanding the basic economics of what a, a, a concentrated common owner strategy might be um, is, is, a, a, is, is, I think, where we need to go in terms of understanding this literature better. Any closing thoughts? Can I give you know, a minute to each of y'all if there's anything you want to close with? I, I, I just want to close with my real enthusiasm. Um, I have booked my train late enough to stay for as much of today as I can. I think this is going to be one of the most interesting debates. I think we are like literally and physically at the intersection of two very interesting areas of law, both of which focus on markets and their optimal functioning. So I just want to thank, really, everyone for being here with us. Yeah, I certainly agree. I, I think um, you know, this is the case for research. This is why uh, research is so important to me. The I mean, the, we're, we're here because um, uh, Martin and Einer and others sort of put this issue in, uh, front and center for us and are making us think hard about it. Um, and so I've, I, as a, someone who was a researcher, now a policymaker, um, it's rewarding for me to see the payoff of that, of that research. And when I say we're at the beginning of the conversation, I mean, I'm not only trying to give you guys more papers to write, I'm also learning in a very real way about the ways that I should think about doing my job well. Um, so I'm very grateful to all of you for that, and I very much look forward to the conversation. Great. With that, please join me in thanking Commissioner Phillips and Commissioner Jackson.
welcome back. Uh, I'm Edward Rock. I teach here at the law school, uh, and it is really terrific to have this session here. Uh, the common ownership issue is one that folks here have, have been thinking about uh, deeply um, for, for, for quite a while, so it's, it's fun to have the session here. Uh, we, we, um, I want to say a word about how this panel fits into the overall structure of the, of the program today. Uh, Commissioner Phillips and Commissioner Jackson have introduced us to the issue and to the tension, to the tension between antitrust liability and corporate governance, to the intersection between antitrust and corporate governance. And it's really a, it's part of what is so interesting about this set of issues is looking at the intersection of antitrust and corporate governance. Uh, something that is not often done, but, but is, uh, is extremely important. Um, the claim, as you heard this morning, as you'll hear more this afternoon, the claim that Martin Schmaltz and co-authors uh, have made is that the structure of common ownership through some mechanism has anti-competitive effects. Einer has argued that it's currently, it's currently illegal under Section 7 of the, of the Clayton Act. And Eric Posner, Fiona Scott Morton, and Glenn Weil have argued that the appropriate solution is to either force firms to choose one firm in a concentrated industry, or limit them to 1%, or force them to commit to complete governance passivity. Um, this then sets up the framework for, for this panel, which is what would be lost if either through antitrust risk, antitrust exposure, firms opted for governance passivity? What would be lost if the Posner, Scott Morton, Weil proposal were adopted and firms in order to maintain their business model opted for governance passivity, opted to put their shares in the drawer and to return to the kind of lack of shareholder engagement in corporate governance that characterized the 50s, the 60s, and really well into the 70s and, and 80s. So a big part of what we're trying to do today is to provide a snapshot of what shareholder involvement in corporate governance looks like in 2018. What the ordinary sort of engagement is, how it, how it works, who initiates it, so that we can see what would be lost if common owners returned to passivity. Another issue you heard in both Commissioner Phillips' talk and Commissioner Jackson's talk is this question of what are the mechanisms by which this anti-competitive effect could happen, could come about. And again, this panel, by talking about what is the, the nature of shareholder engagement in corporate governance in 2018, can cast light on how plausible different proposed mechanisms are, how plausible the lobbying mechanism is, how plausible is it that the large institutional investors in meeting with corporate management are urging them to adopt the soft competition how plausible is it that the mechanism of reducing the amount of relative performance evaluation compensation, or having, to put it more positively, to having greater emphasis on industry profits, industry performance compensation, is a plausible channel by which competition could be restrained. Um, in preparing for the panel, I've, I've asked folks to address a variety of issues, including how do asset managers initiate the engagement? Just how does it work? Um, what are the topics of engagement? To what degree is it firm specific? To what degree is it, is it market wide? Uh, in engagements, what, are the, what, do, what do asset managers raise or touch on? Do they touch on the sort of issues that are proposed to be the mechanism by which the views in favor of soft competition that are attributed to the common owners get translated 
into corporate policy. Um, let me briefly introduce the panel in order of presentation. You have the biographies that tell you much <coughs> more about their distinguished backgrounds. Our first presenter will be Barbara Novick, who is a co-founder of BlackRock, is a vice chair, and now oversees, among her variety of duties, oversees investment stewardship. We'll then turn to Allison Bennington, who is a partner at Value Act, but I should emphasize is not here in that capacity. She's also a member of the SEC Advisory Committee, a member of the Steering Committee of the Investor Stewardship Group, and a member of the Advisory Board of NYU's Institute for Corporate Governance and Finance. And in those capacities, Allison sees and interacts with a wide variety of different kinds of investors and is very much involved in, in understanding and in crafting the, the approach that different kinds of investors take to corporate governance. We'll then turn to Ken Birch, who is the Executive Director of the Council of Institutional Investors, which is the organization in which many of the largest institutional investors gather. Uh, our next speaker will be Heather Slavkin Corzo, who is the Director of Capital Markets Policy for the AFL-CIO. The AFL-CIO has been very involved in corporate governance for decades now. Uh, following Heather, we'll have Holly Gregory, who's co-chair of Sidley Austin's corporate governance practice and is an experienced board counselor and can take us inside the boardroom to see how shareholder engagement looks from the perspective of the directors. We'll then turn to David Hirschman, who's Executive Vice President of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and we will close our first round with Scott Hurst, Associate Professor of Law at BU and the author with Lucian Bepchuk of a very important recent paper that gathers data that looks at how much involvement in corporate governance institutional investors have. Uh, the takeaway, Scott and Lucian's takeaway is much too little. They should do much more, uh, which immediately sets up the tension that characterizes today. It used to be that corporate law scholars divided between those who thought that institutional investors didn't do anything and those who thought that institutional investors did a little bit. With Martin and his co-authors' work, we now get all three positions, potential positions on the spectrum. There are those who think that institutional investors do too little, like Scott and Lucian. There are those, like Martin, who think they do too much. And there are those, like Marcel Kahan and myself, who think it's sort of about right. With that, let me turn it over to Martin. Here's the clicker. Good morning. Um, I'd like to talk about investment stewardship. This is the critical element of the corporate accountability chain that empowers shareholders to engage, to vote on issues that are relevant to the long-term success of the companies that we own on behalf of our clients. It's the very essence of how shareholders can exercise their rights. It clearly matters to asset owners, who are the economic owners of the shares, as they participate directly in the fortunes of the company. It also matters to the asset managers who are fiduciary agents on behalf of those clients, earning a small basis point fee on the total portfolio. Voting in proxies is one of the primary ways that shareholders can express those views. Many asset owners choose to vote themselves. This includes both asset owners who manage assets in-house and asset owners who outsource to asset managers. When the asset manager has the authority to vote, Stewardship codes and regulation not only encourage, but very often require that they do so on behalf of the clients. And of course, as you heard earlier, many asset owners and asset managers use proxy advisors to assist them. The common ownership debate is not about active versus passive. If the theory has any value at all, it would logically apply to any investment strategy in which an investor holds more than one company. Investment strategies are best thought of as a continuum from the most actively managed to the most index oriented, all of which may include multiple companies in a given sector. Stock indexes are a crucial component to the underlying both index and active strategies. Index strategies are designed to closely track the performance of the index by tracking the composition of the index. 
These strategies have grown significantly as they provide the average investor with low-cost access to market returns. Active strategies, by contrast, are intended to outperform the index by deviating from its competition. One of the suggested remedies for common ownership is to limit portfolios to one company per sector. In that case, virtually all diversified portfolios would no longer be viable. Index providers are a key participant in the ecosystem. Companies such as S&P and MSCI create indexes that represent broad markets as well as specific sectors and geographies using a variety of methodologies. Understanding stock inclusion rules and index rebalancings is essential to managing portfolios. The often cited airlines paper assumes that managers continue to hold airlines during periods of bankruptcy, but the reality is quite different. When a company declares bankruptcy, its stock is delisted from the exchange and index providers promptly remove that stock from the index. In contrast, when a company exits bankruptcy, there can be a significant <laughs> lag before the stock is returned to the index. In the case of US Airways, the stock was excluded from the index for over four years. As a rule, index managers sell and buy the stocks close to the timing of these deletions and additions. In the case of the airline paper, 29 of the 40, 56 quarters, that's half, of the study period are impacted by this incorrect assumption. Investment stewardship includes both engagement and voting. Keeping in mind that a company's board represents its shareholders, the primary focus of engagement is on governance issues, as the quality and involvement of the board is paramount to representing shareholders' interests. In addition to board governance, we have engaged with companies to understand their long-term strategy, to assess the alignment of executive compensation with shareholders, to encourage climate risk disclosure, and to understand how a company is addressing human capital management. You'll notice it was never about product pricing. And while we like to think our opinion matters, we represent a minority of the shares outstanding, generally in the single digits, so there is a limit to how much our opinion matters. Let me touch briefly on compensation. When our stewardship team evaluates executive compensation, we start from the premise that boards and their compensation committees should set policies that are aligned with the company long-term strategy. Compensation consultants play a key role in designing these plans. And these plans are based on own firm performance as measured by metrics like pre-tax income, margin <coughs> improvement, shareholder returns, and frankly, outperforming their competitors. Proponents of common ownership believe that the presence of common owners incentivizes company executives to reduce competition. This would mean that CEOs are willing to place the minority interests of common owners above their own personal financial interests, since many are paid in company stock. There's a broad consensus amongst policymakers and asset owners that traditional asset managers should take a serious approach to investment stewardship of client assets. Stewardship codes and other regulations encourage engagement and often require the asset manager to vote in proxies. Over the past two decades, a series of codes have been issued from the UK to Australia to Japan and more. We count close to 20 stewardship codes globally today. In the US, both the SEC and the DOL issued guidance 15 to 20 years ago stating that as fiduciaries, fund managers must vote proxies when doing so is in the best interest of clients. Calls by some commentators to restrict engagement or eliminate proxy voting rights directly contradict these stewardship codes and regulations. Restricting voting would disenfranchise our clients, the asset owners, the result could be an entrenchment of management or empowering short-term actors, both at the expense of the long-term owners. At BlackRock, we evaluate each ballot item on its merits in the context of materiality to the company's long-term financial performance. We believe voting is the ultimate expression of investment stewardship, and a vote against management reflects a failure to make progress in engagement. 
In 2017, 98% of the 28,000 ballot items from companies in the Russell 3000 index were management proposals. Things like election of directors or reappointment of auditors, which are generally considered routine items and receive more than 95% in favor. The exception are say on pay votes, which often get lower support, especially if the proxy advisory firms have recommended against. The remaining 2% of the ballot <coughs> items are shareholder proposals. Roughly half of these are for environmental and social issues. As you can see, the voting on these items has no particular pattern across managers. ISS uses over 380 management agenda codes to categorize voting items for their proxy reports. Not even one agenda code relates to product pricing. The chart also highlights the proxy advisors and their recommendations. Various studies estimate that proxy advisors influence between 10 and 25 percent of the vote. This far exceeds the influence of any individual or even multiple asset managers. Given their influence in voting, any study on shareholder voting must incorporate this effect. However, it is completely ignored in the common ownership papers. So let me wrap up. The stewardship ecosystem, as you've seen, is complex, many different participants. Asset managers are there to provide investors with diversified portfolios to meet their investment needs. And we engage with portfolio companies not to influence pricing, but rather to protect and enhance the retirement outcomes of our clients. This engagement plays an important role in the corporate accountability chain, which has value not just for shareholders, but for society as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Allison? Thank you, Ed. Good morning, Commissioner Phillips and Commissioner Jackson. The lights are bright. I don't know where you are, but thank you. Um, and thank you to NYU and the FTC for inviting me to participate in this panel today on such an important topic with such an august group of fellow panelists. So let me start with that same disclaimer that my remarks today are entirely my own opinion and not that of Value Act Capital. So today, what I'd like to discuss is the recent history of engagement between corporations and their shareholders, what we call corporate governance. <coughs> what corporate governance achieves and what would be lost to the savers, retirees, and investors of this country if the approaches suggested by some in the academic community were to be adopted by the FTC. So first to history. The recent history of corporate governance starts with the financial crisis beginning in 2008. Before the financial crisis, shareholders as a group tended to be more passive and management and boards were dominant. The balance of power was firmly on the side of corporations. Shareholders trusted that management would do the right thing and ceded long-term corporate strategy and direction to management and the board. Effectively, it was as if shareholders put their shares in the drawer and only took them out when it was time to sell. But then the whole world changed. In 2008, the financial crisis struck and over the next few years, trillions of dollars were erased from the savings and retirement accounts of American workers and savers. People who had saved for a lifetime for retirement lost huge portions of their savings or had to work for many more years before they could retire on much less than they had planned. Parents could no longer afford college tuition and household net worth was slashed. Almost every American was negatively impacted by the financial crisis. None more than retirees, workers, savers, and investors. A lot of these savings and retirement funds were invested through mutual funds or index funds, which I'm loosely calling asset managers. I know I don't have these precisely right, but just to give an overall sense, which in turn invested in the shares of U.S. corporations. Many union and public pension funds, what I'm calling asset owners, managed the pension contributions of their workers and also invested in U.S. corporations. The financial crash was an enormous wake-up call for these asset managers and asset owners. Workers and savers and retirees thought their savings were safe and that someone was looking out for them. But asset owners and asset managers thought their investments in U.S. companies were safe and that managers and boards were not taking excessive risks. At that point, asset owners and asset managers, which I'm going to call collectively institutional investors, realized that in order to fulfill their fiduciary obligations, they had to take a role in corporate risk management and keep an eye on the long-term health of U.S. public corporations that they were investing in. They invested time and effort in establishing a set of protocols to engage with company management and boards of directors. 
And this is when the balance of power began to shift. Shareholders insisted that their voices be heard and a new wave of engagement between corporations and these institutional shareholders began, which for lack of a better term, we loosely, we loosely call corporate governance. Then in 2010, Dodd-Frank Act was enacted. Dodd-Frank had multiple provisions encouraging shareholder corporate engagement and provided an important congressional endorsement of the role of shareholders in corporate governance. I'd like to just take a little detour to the SEC, um, and thanks to Commissioner Jackson, I feel it's okay to do so. The SEC is the regulator of both the financial markets and also the U.S. corporations. So when the SEC speaks, the entire U.S. capital and corporate ecosystem listens. And when the SEC encouraged and continues to encourage shareholder engagement with public companies, I'll just give you a few quotes from Commissioner Kara Stein. I would posit that the entire corporate ecosystem's success actually rests on effective communication and collaboration between corporations and their shareholders. When a company, its management, its shareholders, and its employees work together, companies tend to be more resilient and prosperous. In turn, this benefits companies, their corporate stakeholders, and the economy as a whole. Ex-Chairman Mary Shapiro. As a general rule, interested, aware, and active shareholders are good for public companies, and I believe that more shareholder engagement is better. And finally, Commissioner Luis Aguilar. In the end, I firmly believe that companies with corporate governance processes that enhance how they engage with their owners will be more successful than those that keep the door shut. So what does this all boil down to? It boils down to accountability through corporate governance. Any system without accountability eventually fails. Some argue that the financial crisis was caused in part by a cascade of failures in accountability at multiple points in the greater financial ecosystem and public corporations certainly played their part. In the new world of corporate governance, a very clean and clear system of accountability has established itself, a system where everybody is accountable. Everyone has a boss. Here's how it works. Employees are accountable to management. Management is accountable to the board. The board is elected by and therefore accountable to its shareholders. There are many different types of shareholders, but when we're talking about institutional shareholders, institutional shareholders are accounted to those whose financial assets they look after. So who's at the end of that chain? The retirees, savers, workers, union members, investors. The chain of accountability between management and boards and their shareholders is facilitated by corporate governance. And it's the institutional shareholders that have taken the lead in the corporate governance engagement process. If we adopt the suggestions of some in the academic community, institutional shareholder engagement will be choked off. The chain of accountability will be broken between the board and the vast majority of their shareholders. Boards will no longer have a boss, and the rest of the chain will be decoupled. And it's the retirees, savers, workers, and investors who are at the end of that chain who will suffer the consequences. I'm sure that many of my fellow panelists will go into more detail about the topics of engagement between shareholders and management. But the overarching theme is that institutional shareholders want to see their companies run in a way that allows them to assess long-term goals and risk allocation. No shareholder wants to see a company they are invested in on the front page of the Wall Street Journal because of irresponsible corporate conduct that results in the destruction of shareholder value. So where does this leave us and what would be lost if shareholders were blocked from engagement? We've seen what happens when the chain of accountability is broken. I would posit that the healthiest ecosystems are the ones where everyone is accountable. Ultimately, this chain of, the chain of accountability protects the very people whom the academic community is concerned about hurting. Consumers by one name are also workers, union members, retirees, and savers by another. Muzzling shareholders and swinging the pendulum back in the direction of management creates a worrying scenario. As a country, we have been there before. Our financial systems regulators and congressional leaders have led us in the right direction of developing an open shareholder management relationship. In my opinion, it, we should very seriously consider the implications or unintended consequences of a shift in antitrust policy that could have major far-reaching implications for established capital markets policies and practices that have served us all well. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Uh, Ken? Okay. Uh, th thanks, Ed. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Phillips and the FTC. 
Um, I think it's a very, very interesting day, and it's already gotten an inter interesting start. Uh, so my name is Ken Birch. I'm executive director of the Council of Institutional Investors. Uh, we are a, a membership organization of uh, organizations. Uh, our core membership, our asset owners, institutional asset owners, uh, particularly public pension funds. We were set up uh, by public funds in the mid-1980s. Uh, actually to try to fix uh, what was wrong with corporate governance, which was lack of engagement by long-term shareholders uh, with, with the companies that they owned. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back around to that. I do want to uh, uh, make a, a, a few comments uh, on the dialogue uh, earlier with uh, uh, Commissioners uh, Phillips and Jackson, uh, which I thought I, I, I pretty much would identify myself with all of their comments. Um, I did learn even more that NYU is the center of the world, although probably the business school as well as law, I'd have to say. Uh, and I remembered that um, I, I worked at uh, TI, what was then called TIAA CREF uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And we had a, a, a corporate engagement program um, that I think was somewhat groundbreaking. Uh, I had a staff of two retired CEOs, which was, uh, which was kind of a uni unique uh, perspective. Um, we had a pretty vigorous program, and we had uh, Chancellor Bill Allen, who by that time uh, was uh, wor working at the, uh, with NYU, uh, to come in and evaluate what we were doing, and particularly to look for agency problems. And were we actually doing activities that were worthwhile for the beneficiaries? And he did quite a thorough review. Uh, he was largely positive. He had some criticisms. Um, but it occurs to me, only occurred to me this morning, that might be some kind of exercise that's, that, that's worth doing. Uh, based on Commissioner Jackson's uh, uh, comments. Um, I would also say that um, some of the comments were really about getting information to retail holders on stewardship programs in a way that they would uh, um, understand. Um, I would say that the institutional asset managers, uh, many of them, have had a lot of interactions with their asset managers about stewardship for a while. Uh, and so there are models out there, there are folks who are pushing the envelope I'd cite in particular the GPIF, the largest pension fund in the world in Japan, uh, which is uh, in the last couple of years really uh, further developed how to interact with, with uh, asset managers um, uh, on this subject. Um, I have, third, I want to uh, identify myself with Commissioner Phillips' remarks about chilling effects and worry about chilling effects. So I, I worry about chilling effects from actually the common ownership debate itself to some extent. Uh, but also would say uh, the current uh, HSR rules and, uh, are, are uh, the too narrow investment only uh, exemption and uh, too ill-defined investment only exemption I think actually is right now chilling some of the engagement that needs to take place uh, is, is on the liability side from the standpoint of law departments and asset managers that weigh whether, whether there should be engagement or not. Um, I also want to associate myself with both commissioners on the heterogeneity of the uh, uh, participants in this on the investor side. So on the asset manager level, um, uh, I really see um, all kinds of different variety of in interactions. The uh, uh, big indexers have varying levels of uh, uh, fundamental active investment uh, that, they're, that they're doing at, at uh, TIAA. Uh, we in involved our portfolio managers uh, where, they, where they had uh, uh, bets on companies, where they had positive weightings, um, but uh, we, we uh, were largely indexed, and so we worked mostly in, the same, in a similar way that uh, BlackRock did. Uh, active managers um, have different combinations of involving corporate governance staff and portfolio management staff, and it's changed and evolved rapidly in recent years. Uh, uh, the corporate governance discussions tend to be on process with investors trying to understand, do we have faith in this board? Are they awake at the switch? Uh, do they understand how the executive compensation works? Um, and and it, there are discussions about risk management and so on. Th those are the topics that are at the forefront. Uh, for active managers, and, and, and strategy is discussed, but it's more, uh, d does this board, does this board member understand the strategy? Can they articulate it to us? And how does it connect to executive compensation, for example? Um, for more active owners, I think there's more dialogue, uh, no doubt, about strategy, particularly where companies uh, are, are uh, misfiring. But the measure of whether they're misfiring has been, uh, are they doing poorly relative to peers? Um, uh, have, are they missing the boat on strategic change? And those discussions, and I have been in some of those as well, 
including at, at Morgan Stanley Investment Management, where, where I worked. Uh, to the extent they get into execution, it's really uh, about uh, uh, running faster, jumping higher, competing more better, becoming better competitors. So in that sense, some of the com common ownership debate uh, doesn't, doesn't ring true to me in terms of what these discussions actually are about. Um, I also would say there's a little <coughs> bit of tone deafness, I think, in some of the articles about what goes on in asset management firms. Uh, Ed, your paper, uh, this is a trivial, trivial example, but picks up the um, uh, commentary that uh, some investors admitted to engaging uh, with companies uh, using the word uh, uh, sort of admission against interest. That is not an admission against interest. It's probably exaggerated, actually. The admission against interest would be that we're not engaging. Uh, because I should my say that was a quote. Of, that was a quote from a different paper. That wasn't no, no, I know. That was, you, you, but you found it. So we, I, we found it. You yes. found it. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. It was not Ed's paper. It was a paper he was critiquing. Um, and in any case, uh, so uh, engagement is expected uh, at this point in time. Um, just to go back to our founding. So, I, Allison, I would take the history back quite quite a bit further, uh, and you could really probably go back to the 1930s. But in the 1980s the public pension funds felt like they were being squeezed between uh, certain activist holders, uh, particularly those that did green mail, that basically held up companies and got paid off privately, uh, and then corporations that decided to defend themselves by entrenching management through poison pills, uh, through staggering election of directors and other, other, other means, and that there needed to be a voice for long-term investors to advocate for their uh, asset managers and through their own programs to engage constructively uh, with, with, uh, with companies, and increasingly that became focused on the board of directors and trying to make sure that there was good engagement with the board and, um, and, and a, an opportunity for the investors really to, to understand the strength of the board. So I'll stop. Thank you, Ken. Thanks. Heather. Thank you guys, thank you all for being here and for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name's Heather Slavkin Corzo. Um, as Edward mentioned, I'm here on behalf of the AFL-CIO. We represent 12 and a half million union members with more than $7 trillion invested in the financial markets in the form of retirement savings. In addition to that, I am the head of US policy for the UN Principles for Responsible Investment. Um, we are the world's leading proponent of responsible investment with over 2,100 signatories globally investing $82 trillion. Of that, around 400 of our signatories are in the U.S. Uh, with $45 trillion in assets under management. And finally, I'm a senior fellow at Americans for Financial Reform, a coalition of more than 200 civil rights, consumer, labor, business, and other organizations formed in the wake of the financial crisis to lay the foundation for a strong, stable, and ethical financial system. So I got through that, you guys. If you think that took a while, imagine what it's going to be like come tax time. But as for the topic of today's panel, um, we've been asked to discuss what shareholder engagement and corporate governance looks like today. The AFL-CIO has a long history of engaging in corporate governance initiatives. The initiatives that most people who participate in the corporate governance space are most familiar with are the engagements on behalf of the AFL-CIO Reserve Fund, where we file dozens of proposals every year on topics ranging from executive compensation to human rights issues in the supply chain to uh, political spending disclosure. We change the subjects uh, periodically uh, and uh, the, you know, the, the engagement goes back more than 20 years. In addition to that, there's an AFL-CIO equity index fund. Um, it has about $8.4 billion in assets under management, large for uh, you know, the regular person, but compared to what Barbara's managing, it's a, a pittance. Um, and what the AFL-CIO equity index fund is, does is we uh, are a large cap equity index fund. We file shareholder proposals periodically, and there's an AFL-CIO proxy voting guidelines. And so all of the votes are cast in uh, in adherence to those guidelines. Um, so when discussing engagement by large institutional investors, I think it's important to distinguish between the activities undertaken by large money managers versus uh, in, uh, including those who manage pension funds versus uh, large pension funds that may engage more directly in corporate governance matters through the shareholder proposal process. Um, large pension funds have managed to push the agenda on specific issues. Uh, to get a say on issues like uh, executive compensation, board diversity, proxy access, et cetera. In the US context, however, the large money managers have not been as active, in my experience, on direct shareholder proposals through the, the, the SEC process. 
Um, as Barbara spoke about, the rise of stewardship codes around the world, however, has led to an increased focus on how large money managers approach governance and expectations that large institutional investors will show a commitment to transparency and drive good corporate governance practices through engagement and voting. So the ability of investors to engage with companies and the types of issues that may be raised through formal proceedings is limited. The SEC has an extensive body of regulation, guidance, staff legal bulletins, and non-presidential but informative no action responses that guide investors on acceptable topics for engagement on ESG issues through the proxy process. At a very high level, the SEC will grant issuers no action requests to allow for the exclusion of a shareholder proposal if it seeks to micromanage the company or if it's considered ordinary business. If a topic is considered a significant social policy issue, the shareholder proponent may nonetheless overcome a request for exclusion. There may be investors who are engaging with companies through informal means. That's not typically how the AFL-CIO engages. So the subjects that we are engaging in with companies are really limited to the ones that the SEC has determined are acceptable topics. These, are, these tend to be, I'm hard pressed to think of an example that's not an environmental, social, or governance issue or an ESG issue. I can't think of a single instance where we've talked to a company about product pricing. I, and in fact, as I, as I think about it, it's hard for me to imagine that it would even be legal. I think one thing that we have to think about is, is the reality that, that insider trading laws prohibit companies from sharing material non-public information from any in, with any investor. So I, I, it's, it's interesting for me to hear the topics that are under discussion, the, the conversations around whether there may be some anti-competitive impact um, that arises from investor engagement on governance issues. It, it's hard for me to imagine how it would actually happen. Um, and and and, and I think to the extent it was, it would already be illegal and, and cause for serious concern. So I think it's important to look at the questions being raised today about whether investors' engagement on corporate governance matters lead to anti-competitive activities in the context of the larger debate that's happening in Washington that is really aimed at silencing investors when we attempt to, when we attempt to engage with companies on ESG issues. There is a hearing underway as we speak in the Senate Banking Committee right now to consider proxy voting and proxy advisors. Um, and the SEC has taken a number of actions to scale back investors' rights to raise topics of concern with the company through the shareholder proposal process just in the last few months. This is actually the opposite of the direction we should be headed. Individual investors are increasingly concerned about the impact the companies we own are having on the environment, income inequality, and other ESG matters. That is why large money managers are increasingly developing responsible investment options, and we should be encouraging that activity. So I just I want to just take one second to respond. We've heard other panelists respond to this notion that the way to, to respond to the concerns that are being raised about potential anti-competitive activity is to remove the rights of large institutional investors to participate in proxy voting. That is a serious concern to me. I think that would remove a tremendous opportunity for accountability. Um, and as Allison discussed, there is a, there's a balance that exists right now in the corporate governance system that provides accountability along the line. It would be very disruptive to interfere with that. So with that, I'll conclude my comments and thank you all for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Holly, you spend a lot of time in boardrooms. Yes, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here to share a corporate governance lawyer's perspective on, on the issues that you're talking around common ownership. I co-chair Sidley Austin's corporate governance practice. It's a global practice. I advise corporate boards on the whole range of corporate governance issues, including engagement with institutional investors and shareholders. Now for the disclaimers. I have not advised anyone on the common ownership uh, subject matter of this hearing. I have not been retained by anyone to participate in this panel, and the views I express are my own and not for attribution to Sidley Austin or any of our clients. I'm gonna make four observations. First, 
While the institutional investor influence on publicly traded corporations has increased considerably in the past 20 years, the subjects of this influence, as evidenced by the topics on which they vote and the topics on which they engage, and as Heather mentioned, do not appear to extend to ordinary course business decisions. Um, outside of their very limited decision rights as shareholders, shareholders cannot dictate the actions of the corporation's board of, or, or its officers. Directors and officers are fiduciaries, and as such, they're required to make their own judgments in managing the business and affairs of the corporation. Now, shareholder influence, which I mentioned is fairly powerful, comes in large measure from their ability under federal law and regulation to bring non-binding shareholder proposals in company proxy materials, um, and also to have an advisory vote on executive compensation and on the golden parachute compensation. Companies face significant pressure to address say on pay issues where the management proposal does not achieve a significant majority of support and also to implement majority supported shareholder proposals. And failure to do so can lead proxy advisory firms to recommend against the reelection of directors. Now ordinary business operations are not a proper subject of shareholder proposals. Absent an overreaching policy issue, generally what products to offer, what prices to charge, what areas to compete in, are ordinary business operations, and they're excluded from shareholder proposals. And similarly, in engagement efforts, institutional investors focus on the broader issues concerning shareholder rights, board accountability and governance, executive compensation structure, and corporate social and environmental responsibility. And according to the stewardship reports from the large institutional investors and surveys of corporate directors and members of management, the most common topics for engagement in 2018 and 2017 were around board quality and composition and accountability, climate-related risk and board oversight of sustainability issues, executive compensation, including alignment of compensation with company performance and shareholder rights, and, and, and there are more, but, but that's really it. They're not about these ordinary business issues. My second observation, both institutional investors and their proxy advisors heavily emphasize, as reflected in their proxy voting policies, that executive compensation should be aligned with company performance and not with industry performance. The voting policies of institutional investors provide that misalignment between pay and company performance is grounds for a negative say on pay vote, and in certain circumstances, grounds for a negative vote on the re-election of compensation committee members, and that's pretty powerful stuff to a board of directors in thinking about compensation structure. Similarly, the proxy advisors both incorporate relative performance evaluation into their analysis and will issue negative vote recommendations for say on pay if executive pay and company performance are not aligned. Indeed, a misalignment of pay and company performance relative to peers is the most common reason for proxy advisors to recommend a negative vote on compensation, and it is the most common reason for a failed say on pay vote. My third point, the topics on which corporations and their institutional investors engage is heavily influenced by legal concerns, including the need to strictly comply with federal securities and antitrust laws and regulations. Focused attention by corporate counsel in line with written guidance on engagement activity undermines the notion that engagement is a means through which investors encourage companies to soften their competition or through which companies communicate confidential information about their competitive plans. It is common practice in my experience for counsel to provide corporate directors and members of the management team with strict instructions about the rules of engagement, including parameters of topics for engagement. In line with SEC staff guidance, discussion topics are typically pre-cleared with the shareholder and company counsel, either participates in the meeting or briefs the company's participants in advance. Through engagement policies and direct instruction from counsel, participants are reminded that they must not selectively disclose material non-public information in violation of Reg FD. 
They're reminded about tipping and insider trading liability that could result from someone else misusing material non-public information. If engagement is incurring during proxy season, special care is given to abide by the proxy solicitation rules, which only permit attempts to influence shareholder votes based on what has been disclosed in filed proxy soliciting material. Directors and officers are also reminded not to discuss competitive information, customer-specific information, or details about the company's pricing or production capacity. My fourth point. Institutional investor engagement with portfolio companies has contributed to decisions by corporate boards to change corporate governance practices and to provide greater transparency into their decision making. For example, in response to a combination of engagement and non-binding shareholder proposals, a majority of S&P 500 boards now require annual election of all directors, majority voting in the election of directors, and shareholder access to the company's proxy to nominate directors. This influence has a multiplier effect as other corporate boards take heed of these developments as evolving best practices and reflection of broad shareholder expectations. They're implementing these kinds of changes without direct shareholder engagement. The focus is now shifting to the social responsibility and environmental issues and corporate sustainability that Heather mentioned. And so we expect to see changes and greater transparency there as well. In conclusion, if a decline in competition in concentrated industries is in fact associated with common ownership, and I understand that that is a point at issue, the type of engagement between institutional investors and portfolio companies that has arisen largely in the last decade is an unlikely mechanism. If, as some posit, there are purely structural anti-competitive effects, and I understand that that is also a point at issue, Policymakers will face very difficult trade-offs given consumer interests in diversified investment vehicles for investment and college savings and the benefits institutional engagement brings to corporate governance. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. We now turn to David Hirschman from the United States Chamber of Commerce. Is this an issue in which the AFL-CIO and, and the Chamber of Commerce are, are shoulder to shoulder? Actually, uh, a few years ago, I testified at the Senate Judiciary. And that morning, I lost my voice, and uh, I had to explain to Senator Leahy, who was chairing the hearing, that on this issue, the AFL-CIO could speak for us. Uh, that issue happened to be the protection of intellectual property. Unfortunately for all of you today, I have my voice, so you'll have to hear me <laughs> actually agree with Heather and, and Ken. Uh, well, I'll enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Ed, and thanks to Commissioner Phillips, Commissioner Jackson, the uh, FTC and NYU for holding this important forum. The chamber represents three million businesses of virtually every size and shape in this country, public and private, and we tend to come at these issues from the perspective of what will better enable capital formation. In that spirit, we've long encouraged companies to engage more with their shareholders, public companies, and we've engaged and encouraged our asset manager members to engage with companies as well, and both have responded. In fact, uh, so certainly we participate in countless conferences and, and other forums to discuss how shareholders should engage more and how to do that constructively. Where we have disagreed when we have is on proposals that we view as giving one or uh, another group of investors more favorable rules of the road in a way that makes it hard for boards to exercise their fiduciary duty to all shareholders. This has, for example, driven our concern about the lack of transparency and accountability of proxy advisory firms, which I'll talk a little bit more in a moment. So, while we don't always agree with the AFL-CIO and CII, I think we begin from a, and what strikes me about this issue, that the common premise that, that constructive engagement is better is something that uh, I hear widespread uh, agreement on today. Shareholder engagement does not drive down competition. In fact, it can encourage and sustain, and it's important for healthy capital markets. Engagement allows management to communicate with their shareholder base as they implement strategies to generate long-term growth. A recent uh, proxy, our most recent proxy survey showed, for example, that 80% of companies report that they engage year-round uh, in regular communication program with their institutional investors. I'd be the first to say that we should get that number closer to 100%. With that in mind, I'd like to make uh, a couple points. First, uh, the subject to which uh, companies engage with their institutional investors. 
some of the concerns public companies have when it comes to the current practices related to corporate governance, and finally, the role of proxy advisory firms. First, how do investors engage? Institutional investors often communicate directly with the company, and companies reach out to their investors, uh, either through their investor relations department, through management, through the board, in a number of means. And we are fortunate to live in an era where there is accelerating innovation and transformation uh, larger than we've ever seen since certainly the Industrial Revolution. Frankly, I can't recall meeting with a single business leader who isn't laser focused on how to drive that change in a positive way for their business. In fact, because we understand that virtually every business model can be disrupted today, the Chamber is actively focused on removing barriers to innovation and growth. In that environment, companies must be able to communicate their strategy with all types of investors and, share and stakeholders. This is the kind of constructive engagement that is happening more and more and that most investors are seeking. Second, what are some of the concerns we have with the, the way public companies, uh, that public companies have with the current state of play? While we think constructive investor engagement is beneficial, there are ways in which a minority of some special interest investors can use outdated rules to promote their agendas at the expense of other investors. For example, rules governing shareholder proposals have allowed proposals dealing with social political matters to proliferate, even when they fail to gain significant support. We are pleased that the SEC is now looking at zombie proposals and other areas where the proxy rules might need to be modernized so all investors, both retail and institutional, have a level playing field. Third, the role of proxy advisory firms. Proxy advisory firms, as many of us know, have a demonstrated influence in the manner in which large public company, uh, a large number of public company shares are voted. In some companies, it's, uh, it depends on the shareholder base, but it ranges, according to the most research, between 50 and 30 percent. Way too much time is spent in today's boardrooms to try to anticipate what ISS or Glass-Lewis uh, think and how that might impact how they vote in the next proxy season. In fact, many companies feel the need to hire the ISS's consulting arm to help guide them on the non-transparent and unevenly way in which they apply their corporate st standards. To be clear, we are not seeking to federalize or eliminate uh, proxy advisory firms. We simply have pointed out that the, they play an important role and have supported sensible reforms that will enable them to better serve all stakeholders in the capital formation system. Reforms in this area are long overdue, but that's a topic best left to the SEC. My point in raising this issue today is not to labor into uh, the merits or relative merits of proxy advisors, but point out that much of their academic research in this space has failed to even consider the role of proxy advisors, and certainly has not considered how the solutions identified might influence the role that proxy <coughs> advisors play. Finally, I'd like to end with one final word about how the uh, potential, about the potential impact of limiting content ownership could have on capital formation, which as I said is agenda one for the chamber. Index investors play a key role in generating economic growth and job creation in a way that's good for companies, it's good for retail investors, and it's good for uh, retirees. Being part of an index is an important tool to drive liquidity for all companies, but especially so for smaller public companies. If the government places undue restrictions on investments in public companies, it would further discourage companies from going public and staying public. We have seen a sharp decline in the number of public companies over the past two decades, and liquidity concerns for smaller issuers is an important reason. While, there is harm, well, while this is harmful for companies and our capital markets, it's also harmful for retail investors who might not be able to participate in some of the fastest growing and most dynamic companies. So thank you for including me today. We welcome the FTC taking a evidence-based look at common ownership. Uh, this hearing and uh, what I'm sure will follow in discussions is an important contribution to that. Uh, and I'd, uh, uh, I'd urge us all to, uh, to continue to, to challenge the, uh, the science behind some of the things that have been supported and to think about the consequences of some of the solutions being identified to date. Thank you, David. Uh, we now turn to Scott Hurst. Uh, hope the clicker has made it down. Uh, Scott and Lucian Bebchuk have been working on trying to uh, document how much engagement there is uh, in between firms and 
and shareholders. Scott? Thank you, Ed. Um, and so this work uh, builds on uh, work together with Lucian Bebchuk, including a paper last year in the Journal of Economic Perspectives with Alma Cohen, um, a, a work that's currently available on SSRN, um, and uh, ongoing work that looks in more detail at the implications of our analysis for the common ownership debate. And the focus of our work is on the stewardship decisions of index fund managers. Uh, so by stewardship, we mean how they monitor, vote at, and engage with their portfolio companies. Uh, and our work aims to provide a, a systematic, theoretical, empirical, and policy analysis of these stewardship decisions of investment fund managers. Um, and we identify the, the promise of, invest, of institutional investor stewardship um, to combat the problem of agency cost uh, between corporate managers and their shareholders. And so the increasing size of institutional investors over time and the greater monitoring and engagement that this allows uh, is a positive development that can combat these agency problems within corporations. Um, and we show in our work that institutional investor stewardship has this promise for increasing corporate performance. Um, so because of this, we argue that public policy should seek to encourage and to facilitate stewardship and engagement by institutions uh, and not to limit it. So we turn now to the common ownership literature. Uh, and so common ownership alarmists have argued that regulators should pay attention not only to the decisions of these managers of, of corporations, but also to the ownership of those corporations by institutional and investors, um, and in particular, whether these shares are held um, across competitive companies. Um, but in our uh, analysis, uh, we show that the understanding of how these institutional investors act requires taking into account um, their own ownership structure, which common ownership alarmists fail to do. Um, and so we turn to the, the missing mechanism, the link between common ownership and anti-competitive effects, and we make two points. Um, first of all, common ownership, the question of whether common ownership can have anti-competitive effects because the big three or other investment managers might actively encourage anti-competitive behavior. And on this, our work provides a detailed empirical account of the stewardship activities of large investment managers, and we show that such active intervention in business strategy decisions by institutional investment investors is both implausible and inconsistent with the empirical evidence. Uh, second, on the question of the purported link um, by, uh, through passive um, means, um, could, could institutional investors have anti-competitive effects by inducing investment managers to do nothing and therefore tolerate anti-competitive behavior. Um, and our ongoing work suggests that this mechanism is also implausible and unsupported by the empirical evidence. Um, in our paper, we make the point that the claims of, not only are the claims of common ownership unwarranted, but paying regulatory attention to common ownership isn't merely unnecessary, but it's also costly and counterproductive. Um, that because it's corporate managers and not institutional investors that play the, the key role in shaping strategic decisions that determine competitiveness, um, it's these decisions of corporate managers that should be the central focus of regulatory attention and not the actions of institutional investors. Um, and that given the constraints on the attention and the resources of uh, regulators, diverting attention to institutional investors um, and away from the decisions of corporate managers is counterproductive. Um, the measures that those um, highlighting common ownership have put forward are intended to make the big three investment managers and other large investment managers less engaged and more passive. Um, and the very fact that we're having this discussion about the possibility 
of anti-competitive effects of engagement by institutional investors might itself chill engagement by investment managers. Um, and while common ownership alarmists view these measures positively, um, we argue that the effects on investment stewardship would be counterproductive. Um, we claim that we make the point that modern corporations do not suffer from too much shareholder intervention, but rather from too little. And that pushing investment managers away from engaging um, would be a step backwards and would exacerbate agency problems and therefore harm rather than benefit the economy. Um, to conclude, uh, the rise in investor engagement is a positive development that contributes to a reduction in agency problems and therefore contributes to economic performance. Um, the incentives of investment managers make them insufficiently active and excessively deferential to corporate managers. Um, and the measures that common ownership alarmists advocate would be counterproductive um, in, in all of these respects. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Scott. We're, we're now gonna to turn to a discussion among the panelists, but please, uh, if you have questions, uh, please fill out one of the question cards uh, that will then be brought up to pose to the, to the panelists. Also, for, especially for those who are watching online or will watch online, uh, the, the FTC welcomes written submissions on these issues and finds them very helpful in terms of filling out their understanding of, of what's going on in the, in, in the uh, corporate governance universe. So please send in uh, written submissions as well. I, I wanna drill down on this notion of engagement. Engagement has, there are at least three different types of engagement that are interestingly different. One is the engagement over high profile contests. So Tryon runs a contest uh, to elect Nelson Peltz to the board of Procter & Gamble. These are high stakes contests with real potential effect on firm value. There may be 10 to 20 of those a year, and that's one sort of engagement. We know that to a large degree in, in those sorts of engagements, uh, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, the big three, often collectively, though they don't act together, collectively hold the decisive votes. Uh, and we often hear from, from folks who are con contemplating bringing proxy contests that you need to win two of the three in order to prevail. There's a second sort of engagement, which I think of as, as market-wide governance issues. Things like, is it appropriate to have annual voting on directors or is a staggered board okay? Is it okay to have a poison pill or not? Should there be majority voting? That's a different sort of engagement. It's a different set of issues. And the third sort of, but it's market-wide. The third sort of engagement is on firm-specific performance, firm-specific pay, uh, and that's yet a different sort of engagement. And I think it's useful to think about these three categories of engagement differently and address them, address them separately. What I'd like to, to do now is, is, is turn to, first to Barbara and then to Holly and Heather, to to take us inside the, the room, if you will, right? When we're talking about engagement, what are we talking about? How many, how many meetings a year does BlackRock have with portfolio companies? They own everything, and there are a lot of companies out there, both here and abroad. How often, how often can BlackRock meet with individual companies? Uh, once a year? once every three years, once every five years. How does that differ with respect to high profile contests like Procter & Gamble's proxy contest versus the ordinary day-to-day -day, uh, day -day kind of engagement? And finally, what are the topics of these different forms of engagement? How much Holly pointed out to, to the directors having instructions about what they can talk about and what they can't talk about and encouraging directors to reach out to the shareholders before meeting so that there's an agreed upon set of, of issues. If you could take us into, into that world. Okay, so first let me make very clear. Uh, BlackRock does not collude with any other firms on our voting on any topics. Uh, that's a very important thing because the idea that there are a big three and they all vote as one 
is a misnomer. When you look at the data, in fact, our voting is quite different from each other, and there is no concept of aggregation because we don't compare notes beforehand. Okay, so now, I wanna share some, both numbers and some anecdotes that I think will help in explaining um, Ed's question. First thing is, we think about engaging with companies on a few key um, areas. One is, we vote at lots of shareholder meetings, I'll give you some numbers on that. And sometimes we need to clarify something that's in the disclosures, simple questions. Second is, there might be an event at the company I don't want to pick on Trian, but since you brought them up, maybe they're doing something or some other activist is doing something and we want to engage with all of the parties so that we can hear everybody's story and understand how we want to vote in the best interest of our clients as shareholders. Another area is what I'll call thematic governance. So what would be examples this year? We announce our engagement priorities. In fact, we're quite transparent. We put them on the web. We talk about them in Larry's letter. We do lots of things to make sure people know what issues are we concerned about. One of the issues we identified was board composition and diversity. And I'm happy to say when you look back at the end of the proxy season this year, there was a noticeable increase of women on boards. It actually moved two percentage points in the last year. Now, for the women in the room, hooray, right? I mean, we've been talking about this forever but you barely see the needle move year after year after year. Now, the more we focus on it, the more we talk about it, we find boards do say, let me think about that. Let me really rethink how I'm approaching the next search. Other uh, more industry specific topics, things like opioids. So there's a whole chain of what goes on from manufacturing to distribution. We wanna understand how companies in that business are managing their risks, are enforcing current laws, and are making sure that we are protecting the value of those companies, again, that we engage in on behalf of our clients. How often do we meet with individual companies? Very much depends on, are there any of those issues on the table? We also meet with companies when they request a meeting. And generally, we encourage that off season, so not during the proxy season but just to get to know management better, to get to understand the company better. Um, I mentioned in my prepared remarks, it's never <coughs> about product pricing. It's about the board, it's about governance, it's about risk management, it's about much higher level things. In the 2018 proxy season, to put some numbers on it, we had 2,049 company engagements. Uh, we voted in 17,151 meetings. Uh, we voted on 158,942 proposals, and that included voting in 89 countries. Now, where would I get stats from that? Once a year. How, how big is your engagement group? We have 40 people. Once a year, we publish an annual report where we detail what were our engagement pr priorities and topics, give examples of engagements that actually occurred, talk about the voting statistics and things like this, how much do we vote? Uh, that's the engagement part. In the US alone, there were 3,904 meetings with 31,265 proposals. So you kind of get a sense of the magnitude. Are we gonna have the resources to do some deep dive and try and manage a company? No, and it's not legal, as you've heard from the other panelists. So uh, let me just refer back to uh, some of what Rob Jackson said, Commissioner Jackson, and other people about disclosure. If you read the editorial, um, the op-ed that was um, submitted by Jack Bogle, both of them have a commonality. They go through and they talk about the different potential remedies, and they actually reject all of them except disclosure. Why? Because disclosure, sunshine, it's a good thing. It is self-correcting. We already do all of this. We publish the engagement priorities, we publish the voting guidelines, we publish the actual voting, we put out quarterly reports by, by region, we put out an annual report that is global. We are incredibly transparent, and frankly, we encourage a raising of the bar industry-wide to have similar transparency for more managers. Holly, take us into the boardroom. Yes, indeed. Um, Look, I think there are all kinds of different 
situations that give rise to engagement. But engagement often, at least in large S&P 500 companies, has started to follow sort of a, a pattern throughout the year. Immediately after the annual meeting, um, the, the company, the board, and the company management are trying to understand how shareholders voted. And there will be, in the fall usually, some outreach to large institutional investors. Some of it's through surveys, written surveys, to get to a bigger group of, of shareholders, but also through meetings to find out what's on their minds, what was on their minds when they voted, what drove some of the votes, if there were any problematic votes, and also what do they think the big issues are gonna be in the proxy season going forward, just to start to get a, a temperature. So that helps the board sort of get ahead of the game if there are kinds of corporate governance issues that they think they should be looking at. Um, I wanna point, and, and then as you get into proxy season, it changes. It depends on the kinds of shareholder proposals you're getting, the kinds of pressures for engagement that may be coming from investors. But really, it's important to understand that engagement happens in really two directions. And often we're counseling uh, boards and management members to be in listening mode when they meet with their investors to really use it as an opportunity to hear what's on their minds. And in other situations, the company has a viewpoint that they want to help get across and emphasize. Um, I do think a real positive development in engagement efforts generally is that it's becoming far more common for a, an independent director to participate. Investors often ask for an independent director to participate and, and because they want to get that sense of how engaged is the board, how knowledgeable is the board around some of the kinds of issues that are on their mind. There are a couple things that including that independent director do. Um, certainly it helps uh, in that discussion with the shareholder to um, let them know how engaged the board is. But it really adds a level of rigor into the company's preparation for those discussions, including rigor around the kinds of legal issues, what will be the topics discussed, and the level of preparation. Can, and I also can think- Can I follow up on that just for a second? Sure. Do you, in, in preparing directors and managers for those meetings, mm -hmm. Does the issue of talking about future pricing strategy come up? We have a standard memo that we provide to teams that are gonna go into engagement that talks about antitrust concerns, absolutely. Um, so I, I, it, it's definitely there in, in the kind of counsel that legal counsel, at least in my experience, are giving, and that's based on what I do. Um, uh, it, it, Having an independent director, though, in addition to enhancing the rigor and being a real way for uh, the shareholder to get a sense of, of how involved the board is, it also means that the board now has a real window into the engagement. And so it adds a level of scrutiny um, that I think is also very helpful. Boards are very interesting in those engagement efforts and when a comp committee chair or a lead director, or chair of a non-gov committee, um, chair of an audit committee goes into an engagement meeting, the expectation is that they're gonna report out on that discussion to the board. And Heather, when, when you're meeting with issuers, with companies about various shareholder proposals that the AFL-CIO is, is presenting, tell us, about, tell us about those meetings. Mm -hmm. So, as you suggested, typically when we're having meetings with issuers, they come about because we filed a shareholder proposal at the company and they're reaching out, out to us then to, to have a conversation about it. And, um, it, it, you know, the nature of the conversation depends on, on what the, the issue is. Uh, we would I, I can't say never, I, we, we would never talk about <laughs> product pricing, but typically the, the topic of the conversation is within the, the scope of the, the shareholder proposal that we've submitted that's limited as a result of the SEC regulations that limit the subject matter of the proposals we're permitted to submit. Now, the, the conversation that happens um, d depends on where the company stands with regard to the proposal. So sometimes the company will come to us and say, you know, you raised this issue with us about our political spending disclosure, and it was something that we hadn't really thought that much about until you filed the proposal, and thank you for doing that. We are go we're gonna do X, Y, and Z in response to the proposal. If we do this, will you withdraw the proposal? And then we will we'll negotiate. Um, and oftentimes we end up withdrawing the proposal in response to that interaction. 
Um, you know, sometimes the company will come to us and say, we think you got it wrong. We think your analysis is incorrect. Um, it, you know, the, the justification for this proposal is not based on, is based on an understanding that differs from our understanding. And so then we have a conversation again, confined to the bounds of the, the subject matter that we've raised with the company through the shareholder proposal process. And then, of course, sometimes we don't have a conversation with the company and we receive no action letter um, from the SEC. And then there's a, a very time consuming process that involves our on staff attorneys, you know, responding to the submission that the company has filed with Securities and Exchange Commission asking for permission to exclude our proposal. It could be on any number of grounds. Um, and, and we go back and forth uh, and ultimately get a determination from the Securities and Exchange Commission as to whether they're granting the company's no action request and then know whether our proposal will go to a vote at the annual meeting. We do have an open door policy, so we've had a number of meetings similar to what Holly suggested that are not, you know, inside the, the shareholder proposal schedule. Um, and we, we, we have conversations, but again, it's very clear when we're engaging with these companies, we have a handful of proposals that we file each year. It's broadly recognized what the subjects are that we're gonna be discussing the issues that we care about, and we stick to the, to the boundaries of, of those topics. Do you mind if I just jump in here Please. for a sec? So when, when I was preparing for this um, panel today, um, I thought a lot about what is it that these interactions can be. Um, and sort of from the top level, like Barbara mentioned, um, board composition, issues of engagement that, um, that Heather was talking about. And, and I looked and looked, and I found the most detailed type of engagement questions I could possibly find. And I will actually read those to you. <laughs> I've never seen anything this detailed. So I'm going to read to you, I think, as far de detailed as I think it goes. And this is from SASB, which is the um, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Um, and what they, SASB does is they divide into 79 sectors, so very specific, into sectors. And what they do is they provide a, guide, a set of guidelines for, um, for uh, owners if they want to think about risk management and consider questions to potentially ask managers um, and corporate managers in connection. And so I'm going to read this to you because I think it maybe provides kind of the Either, I don't know if this is ceiling or the floor. It's one or the other. Okay, so for the um, wireless telecommunications industry, which I tried to find the most concentrated industry I could find, <laughs> which is my understanding is the top four or 93% of the market. Okay, so I'm going to read you a couple of the things that um, SASB says may be things that um, owners want to engage with managers to understand corporate risk. Okay. Um, what internal processes does the company employ to protect and defend against cyber attacks? How does the company identify and address data security risks across its product lines? What is the level of capital investment the company has made into improving the reliability and quality of, service, of the service network? How does the company manage leveraging customer personal data for revenue opportunities with maintaining customer privacy? So those are some of the most detailed um, business-oriented sort of questions or potential engagement I've seen, and I just point out that what are those topics and what are they not? So um, that's just a little bit of food for thought, and uh, people might want to take a look at this HASB guides. So let me, let me follow up on that with a question from, from the audience, uh, which I'll interpret slightly to bring within this. So Barbara, you, you were very proud of the effect that your initiatives on gender diversity on the board had. Um, and the, Larry Fink has talked in his letter about ESG initiatives, you've talked about guns, policies, and so forth, where you've brought about real change in companies. The question is, how is it possible to promote those goals, but not also, and here I'm interpreting, but not also have the power to promote anti-competitive goals? So is the, is, the, is the reason that you think BlackRock doesn't promote anti-competitive goals is you don't have the power? Maybe because to do so, you would have to drill down much more uh, specifically than the kind of level of questions that Allison was pointing out? Is it, is it because you don't view it in your interest? Where does the, the, the question is being asked is if you, if you can succeed in bringing about change in gender diversity, then why can't you succeed in forcing companies to adopt a soft competition 
Okay. Approach. So the first thing is, keep in mind, we have, let's call it 5% ownership. So even on gender diversity, if we were the only voice out there saying that we thought diversity of thought, diversity on various dimensions was important, it would fall on deaf ears. No one would care. But when there is a chorus of voices across the spectrum of different asset owners, it then resonates with a company, gee, this is something important I should be thinking about. Mm -hmm. If you look over the long term, the ideas of overboarding, the ideas of acti active CEOs sitting on multiple <coughs> outside boards, all of these governance issues have shifted over very long periods of time because more owners have spoken up. We heard about the PRI today, we heard about the SASB. Mm -hmm. you know, there are many different groups that are weighing in on corporate governance issues. None of them are weighing in on competition issues. I mean, it's as simple as that. If we somehow in some weird scenario decided to ignore all antitrust and competition law, which we're not going to do, um, we would be the only one because everybody is subject to certain rules. So the idea that any one actor can have that influence, if anything, and I think we've heard this today, the sole actor that has the most influence is the proxy advisory firms, right? 15 to 25 percent on say on pay. So if you're a public company and you're concerned about a vote coming, the first place you look is those firms because they influence such a high percentage of the voting individually. And that's the part that's completely missing from any of the common ownership analytics. They're just completely ignored. The, the, Holly, I want to I want to turn a question to you. The 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 let's take the scenario in which the, the so-called conflictual scenario that was mentioned uh, this morning. That is to say, a, a, a um, proposal that one firm in the oligopoly should take a hit because it's better that it loses sales because it benefits the this purported common owners portfolio-wide uh, interest. And I'm, I'm now thinking, in the boardroom, the, the question, one of the questions from the audience was, do interventions by activist investors, Carl Icahn, et cetera, impose sufficient market discipline where management is lagging to prevent anti-competitive behavior? Tell us a little bit about what I now hear from lots of people, which is this notion of thinking like an activist before the activist shows up and how that is shaping boardroom <laughs> discussions. Well, look, the, there's clearly great um, interest in boardrooms across America in how activist investors think for a couple of purposes. One, to think about how to be prepared to defend against an activist incursion, but also because there's a sense of it's a way to challenge the management team to really think about opportunities that they might otherwise miss. So it provides a, a I, I could argue, a healthy disciplining to, to know that, that that group is out there. Um, I think when boards are thinking about those activists, they're trying to think about um, what, what their weaknesses are from a corporate governance perspective that could be attacked, what kinds of strategies an activist might come forward to and, and, and recommend, and are those um, legitimate strategies and things that should be undertaken. But um, I don't think that their strategies, again, around the anti-competitive kinds of issues that the common ownership debate is concerned with, the, they tend to be kind of bigger picture. Sometimes they're structural. Um, I don't know if I'm getting to your question, but that's my experience with how boards really look at those issues and the kind of influence that activists have when they're not yet at the gates. Barbara? So I wanted to just add one little thing. You know, we heard earlier that you know, somehow activists are cultivating the index voters vote. So again, stats are helpful. In 2017-18, the proxy year in the US, there were 19 contests that had dissident nominees to the board. To put in perspective, we voted in favor of about 20%, and we voted against 80%. Now, if you look again at the other firms, I don't have their data here, 
But I think what you'll find is they voted differently contest by contest because stewardship and engagement is about hearing the perspectives of all the people who are putting up a slate and making a decision in your best judgment as a fiduciary, what do you think is in the best long-term interest of these shareholders? So it's not voting all one way or all another way or voting collectively. It just doesn't exist. Let me, let me move on to a, another topic, which is there are different ways in which investors communicate with firms. We've been talking about these engagement meetings, uh, but another way in which investors and others communicate with firms is earnings calls. And often quarterly, managers, typically CEO, the CEO, the CFO, occasionally a director, will get on a conference call with whoever wants to be on it. It'll typically be shareholders and, and others who follow the company. Uh, that would be another potential channel by which, it is a, it's a potential channel by which shareholders can influence uh, company strategy. Is it the same people who are on these calls as who are doing the stewardship? Are they different people? Are these different kinds of relationships? What's the, well, let's talk now a bit about, about the earnings call. Uh, Holly, you, you, you deal with, uh, with folks who are having to go on these earnings mm -hmm. calls, uh, and then I'll turn to, to others on the, on the panel who want to jump in. Well, the, the same kind of preparation goes into earnings calls. Um, directors tend to be a little less engaged in that, but there's a lot of preparation and there's a clear understanding around the team of the rules of the game. But the thing about earning calls that's so interesting to me is they're public. So if something happens on an early earning call, the regulators have every ability in the world to be scrutinizing that and taking action. So I don't see earning calls as the, as the issue, if you will. Now, I can't promise that analysts don't ever say things that are probably not appropriate topics for earnings calls, but um, I, don't, I don't know that, that, that that's actionable either. I think it would be interesting to know what kind of guidance analysts get when they go on earning calls, and that would be interesting to hear from the investor perspective. Barbara, who, who from BlackRock is on the earnings calls? So you have to look at our business, and every asset manager is going to have a different mix. In our business, our equities are 90% index and 10% active. So in the index, it would be um, probably no one's on the earnings call, or if they are, they're in listen-only mode because they're curious to learn more about the company. And that would be the, the stewardship team, and that's where I am involved. On the 10% that is active, it would be a portfolio manager or an equity research person who has a, a much stronger interest in that company. But as you heard, those calls are public. I think people have a pretty good idea of what the rules of the road are and would not stray into that territory. And when they're- uh, Can I just add this? I've been in a lot of uh, not public, private conversations with portfolio managers and analysts. Uh, with, with management and sometimes directors. Um, and in all the, all the conversations that I've had, I can think of only two where there were inappropriate comments from a regulatory standpoint, both really FD. One actually involved antitrust, but it was antitrust strategy and uh, uh, our, one of our analysts trying to push the company to disclose privately what wasn't public. Uh, and in that case, the company said, we can't talk about that. Uh, in the other case, a director started to talk about the next quarter and what he expected for the earnings, totally inappropriate. We stopped that conversation uh, because we were going to have to ha have a trading freeze. Uh, so you've got two parties, and, and they're both sort of uh, steeped in the rules. And there are slips occasionally, but I think, in, in my experience, one or the other will, will stop that conversation. And in terms of, so you have analysts, you have portfolio managers who know a lot about the company because they, mm -hmm. they're picking and choosing stocks. They have to decide whether to sell, to hold, to buy more. You've got proxy stewardship groups that have this broad, this broad responsibility to make sure that you vote on all the things you have to vote on. Tell us a little bit about the intersection and the interaction between those two groups and how that informs the work that the proxy voting group does. So in many cases, uh, we have holdings that are only in an index portfolio and figure we, we manage against so many different um, indices, we have sort of every company in some way um, in an index portfolio. And the percentage is based on which indices do clients choose to put their money in. 
Where there is a overlap with an active holding, we encourage the stewardship analyst and the active equity analyst to have a conversation to compare notes. We actually allow at BlackRock that there can be a split vote. So when you look at our actual voting, you will find cases where we did not vote 100% of the shares the same way. And that's a, an, a conscious decision we've made that an active portfolio may have a different perspective. And while they compare notes beforehand, they may have different reasons. I'll give one easy example. Let's say an active portfolio manager just established a position in a company. It would seem that they're confident they're coming in at a good price. They're confident in that management going forward. But let's say the stewardship team has engaged over time and feels that some things haven't been done that they want to see done. So the stewardship team may say, you know, it's time, you know, we have patience, but patience is up. It's time for us to vote against some specific director, call it the <coughs> audit committee, the compensation committee, whatever. Whereas the active manager who just bought that company, just entered, might say, well, I entered on the premise that I understand what's going on and I think there's gonna be change over time and I'm okay being patient now. So you see those kinds of splits. And they can be splits on other things, uh, but it is, a open dialogue internally and then an independent decision for the vote itself. Do others on the panel want to jump in on this before I, I move on to a, a related topic? Yeah, so if you look at, yeah, go ahead, David. I think two points quickly. One is um, from our experience, asset managers and investors take their fiduciary responsibility to represent the underlying interests they represent for the and IC. I think you heard that today from Barbara, and, and management takes its fiduciary responsibility to shareholders pretty seriously. We can't lose sight of the fact, though, that the way to influence corporate behavior goes well beyond that relationship to the court of public opinion in a way that consumers are increasingly participating in, employees, investors, right? And it's that, it's, we have to be careful not to confuse both of those. Uh, companies respond to both, they care a lot about their reputation, but that doesn't mean every debate belongs on the proxy. Hey, Ed, can I just, one, one other miss here, uh, thinking of Barbara's comments on split votes and so on. Uh, our, many of our members retain vote authority, so BlackRock may be managing their money, but BlackRock's not voting their shares, and I don't think that's reflected in some of the literature. Sorry, we, we estimate 25% of our equity separate accounts clients retain the vote. So large public plans who have their own mm -hmm. stewardship teams. Um, and so whereas we have to report the voting under the, the uh, various forms, uh, 13F is the one that's applicable to these studies. Because you have investment authority. Because we have investment authority, we're required to report these as you know, shares that we have investment authority over. But a huge percentage of them, we actually don't vote. There's a slug that is voted by the clients themselves. There's another whole slug that we have to outsource for regulatory reasons or conflict reasons. And so you've got a data set on what theoretically is voting data that doesn't actually reflect the manager's voting authority. The, if, if you look at the, the antitrust enforcers approach historically to both common ownership and cross ownership, uh, the, the threshold is much higher than we're talking about here. This is a much lower level. But in addition, one of the factors that the antitrust enforcers look at is whether, you, whether the investor has, or the, the cross owner or common owner has board representation. Uh, and this brings me to one of the questions from the audience. Section eight of the Clayton Act bars interlocking directorates. Does the panel accept the antitrust concerns underlying this law? If not, why? If yes, would these concerns extend beyond, as the question puts it, formal board membership? But what I would, I interpret that as saying, to the extent that there are large shareholders who have influence, uh, should the same antitrust, and I think this is a fair interpretation of the question, should the same antitrust concerns that motivate Section 8 of the Clayton Act and the bar on interlocking directorates also bar common ownership? So, so my answer is no. Um, I didn't give the lawyerly, it depends. Um, 
it's a different nature of control and influence. A board has control. A board has fiduciary obligations. And so you want to make sure that the boards of competitors are indeed separate groups of people for the most part. Um, the influence that we're talking about investors is a, it's an important influence. I think it's brought great benefits. Um, and, but it's not, it's not the same, it's not control. Even when it's strong influence, there are all of the, there are other investors who have, who are trying to exert influence in great, in, in different ways. The, the amount of ownership by any individual investor in a company is still not nearly at the levels that we consider to be problematic. So I just think, I think it's apples and oranges. Heather, does the AFL-CIO nominate directors? No. <laughs> um, you know, there have been a couple of times I can think of, I've, I've been with the AFL-CIO for almost 12 years, there have been a couple of times where we have supported vote no campaigns, but I can't think of any examples where we've actually nominated. It's a very onerous and expensive process. Um, and, you, and, and so I don't think even the threat of that or the ability to do that would create the implication of some sort of control, you know, or influence over the firm. And, you know, I agree with Holly. Investors, we, we talk about ourselves as owners of a firm, but I think that really does overstate the level of control we have over the operations. A director is extremely different in terms of the ability to influence decision making within a company. Can I say something along those lines? Sure. So, so I know in the economic literature and also in the legal literature, there's a lot of discussion about principals and agents and about the shareholders being the principal and the directors being an agent. That's a, it, it, it's a, it's an interesting construct, but from a legal perspective, it's not a true construct. So a principal can direct the activities of its agent. Shareholders cannot direct the activities of the board because the board is charged with managing and directing the affairs of the corporation under state law, and that's a power of the board that doesn't belong to the shareholders, even if all the shareholders come together as one. They can vote out the board, but the board is a separate entity and has that obligation. So if, if I could also jump in. So uh, this idea of nominating directors, I'm going even further than that. This traditional asset manager, so I'm talking long only, whether it's active or it's, it's index, and there could be some exceptions, but the traditional asset manager does not nominate directors and does not put shareholder proposals even on a ballot. So the AFL-CIO is taking a very active decision to be active in shareholder proposals, but most of the managers don't even put a proposal on, never mind you know, get into a proxy fight on directors. We've never done either of those. Ken, your members? Do they, do, do you sense from your members any desire to nominate? Candidates? Well, so, so uh, members have won the proxy access tool uh, and expect it will be used sometime in the next few years. It's, it's a very difficult tool. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I think realistically it's the um, uh, hedge fund activists or the activist holders who are running real contests that are really holding management accountable and hope, hopefully uh, getting noticed by other boards who want to want to be competitive and, and, and stay on the top, top of their game. Um, so that they're not targeted by those activists. So yes, there is some interest, but it's really for the extraordinary situation. It will be used in some situation where a company has extended poor performance, where it has ignored its shareholders repeatedly. Um, uh, and Holly's right, the, the board manages the company, uh, but a poorly performing company that doesn't listen ever to shareholders, I mean, that's kind of a tenuous position. Um, and it's probably going to mm -hmm. be a company that actually an activist, a hedge fund activist is going to have some questions whether they can make money in the company or not, uh, but the pension funds have run out of patience. And, uh, but it's going to take a lot of work. i just jump in there for one second. I, I talk about accountability, and just to be really clear what that is, really what it means is you can fire the board by not voting for them. 
but that's really it. <laughs> I mean, that is the ultimate tool you have as a shareholder, is you fire the board. And it's not easy to do that, and It's really, really hard. Um, something that I have seen, though, in the corporate governance work that I do um, is the desire for um, particularly on um, issues around um, policy issues, of diversity on the board, different thinking, um, shareholders having the desire to potentially offer up some ideas um, to the nominating governance committee on uh, people who might be good. But these are not proxy fights. These are, um, these are well-intentioned shareholders who think that they may know somebody who might be somebody that the company might want to consider. But that's about as far as I've ever seen it go um, for um, asset owners and asset managers that are not literally activist investors who do run proxy fights. Yeah, and I think most of them actually don't even want to suggest names. <laughs> yeah, a lot of them don't. But much less put one of their employees no. on the board. The, uh, Scott, a question from the audience. Uh, Scott says that the common ownership debate itself may have a chilling effect on engagement and increase uh, deference to managers. Does he or others on the panel have thoughts on the remedies proposed by the common ownership proponents? I mean, I think that point is that the, the fear of these remedies and the fear of increasing regulation of the kind that's being proposed is going to limit the extent to which managers, uh, sorry, investment managers might engage. You know, what, what kind of remedies um, do we think would be appropriate? We think that the, the remedies that are being put forward to, that would have the effect of limiting engagement are misguided and that none of those are appropriate because we, the, the problem doesn't exist because of the incentives of the investment managers don't leave them to take this anti-competitive behavior. So I think I don't, we don't believe that there's a need for a remedy because the incentives of the investment managers aren't such that creates this problem. Yeah, so we, our, our members don't want to take away the proxy vote from the large index investors. Uh, we believe it's, uh, that's the opposite of the direction that we've tried to push in for the, for the last 30 plus years. Um, so that's not, in our mind, would be a very damaging solution. Uh, the idea of essentially banning the largest complexes from doing index investing, which is what, when you're saying invest in one company per industry, uh, that is not indexing. That, that is some kind of active strategy, and I don't even understand how it would work. Would the government assign who can be in mm -hmm. which company, or what, uh, and, and even defining the, the uh, uh, industries is actually a huge problem. Anyway. Uh, um, uh, I think that what that means is breaking up uh, BlackRock, State Street, and uh, mm -hmm. Vanguard. Um, and I think that's going to lead for, to chaos, more cost. Um, you know, there may be legitimate antitrust concerns at some point, but the case really has to be made that it's worth the cost and disruption. Uh, it would be expensive for our members. I just, I just want to weigh in to associate myself with the, the issues that Scott and Ken have raised about concerns with the policy proposals that are put forward. And in fact, say, or repeat what I said earlier, that I think it's extremely important, in fact, that large institutional investors get more engaged um, on ESG issues um, as opposed to less. And to the extent we're looking for positive ways, I think the, the best way to do that is to make it easier for analysts to access more information about environmental, social, and governance issues at the companies that we're investing in by improving those disclosures. Do you want to jump in on that? So I would say to date, this has not chilled our enthusiasm for engagement or voting. Uh, there are laws on the books that, again, not just encourage us, but actually require us to vote. And we think informed voting, which requires engagement, is a sensible way to do it. Um, now that said, if the laws change, um, the SEC or the FTC changes the law, we'll reevaluate and follow the new laws. Um, I will say that while a lot of time is spent on the remedies, uh, we have some fundamental questions about the underlying models and econometrics. And I think as people get a chance to test these models, they've only been made publicly available quite recently, I think they will see that this is much ado about nothing. And in fact, we don't need these remedies because there isn't a problem. Can I just add, um, so BlackRock is, is very active and has really taken a leadership position. There are 
pretty large folks who are on the fence and, and are not out there as much as some of our members would like them to be. Uh, and I would point in particular to, to some larger quant firms um, that are inhibited by both the SEC and FTC regulation, and, and it just is too much hassle. Just so let's let's just back off. On so, the fence about what? About getting involved? About engaging. And engaging. Yeah. I mean, everybody votes. Everybody votes. You have to vote. Uh, but some people um, uh, vote down the line with ISS, uh, which which David doesn't like. Uh, you know, uh, some people are, are just checking the box and not not doing the job. So let me let me follow up on that because the 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 universe of asset managers is heterogeneous, mm -hmm. and for, let, let's take, just as an example, a, a high-frequency trading house that has a huge position for maybe a right. minute or so, right. and it happens that one of those minutes falls on the record date. So they have the vote. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't expect. I, I what don't. sort of engagement, if any, do you want from, from that yeah. sort of shareholder? I don't want engagement from a high-frequency trader, and I, they don't want to do it, and so that's fine. I'm really talking about other kinds of firms that are not high-frequency traders, uh, that particularly that use quant models, and so they don't have the analysts to, to really understand. What um, kind of engagement do you want from them? So I, actually, ideally, some thoughtful proxy voting, that, that, that they actually do the job. Uh, and I recognize there's a scale, <coughs> scale problem here, but many of them are quite large. Uh, and I think could do a more careful job around that and occasionally communicate with, with companies uh, uh, where, where they see something that they're concerned about. So Probably. it's an interesting theory of how, how the world should work, but, but every investor, as you note, they're not monolithic. And they have their own um, strategies on how to best extract value and where to spend their resources. I'm concerned that too much pressure on investors to thoughtfully vote leads them to hire proxy advisors and vote as proxy advisors tell them to and, and say that that's our thoughtful voting. Um, so I, I, I just think it's a little bit um, uh, misguided to, to sort of insist that everybody engage because engagement is expensive. Um, Companies are struggling to find the time for engagement. They can't engage with every shareholder. Shareholders, in the, in the large institutional investors, are also finding it difficult to accommodate corporate requests to engage. If you're in the Russell 3000 and not the S&P 500, it is damn hard to get a meeting with an institutional investor. It's hard to get a phone call. Yeah, I guess I'd just say, I think there are some that should be engaging that are not. Uh, Clearly, you have, have a, a whole range, range of styles. I do know that the legal departments at asset management firms are very cautious, having dealt with them at two different large asset managers. So we have, we have a bit more than 10 minutes uh, to go. So I, I want to give each of you a chance to, to make, a, a final, make final comments. And I'll do it in the reverse order that we went in. So I'll start with, with Scott. Thank you, Ed. I think our main point is that it's imperative that the debate take into account the incentives of the investment managers and doing that makes it clear that incentive managers in, the investment managers have incentives to engage not too much but too little and so the remedies should not be focused on the possibility of them over engaging and possibly resulting in anti-competitive conduct but we should be thinking about the problem as how do we have these investment managers that control large parts of uh, public companies, engaging with them in thoughtful ways and not being constrained from doing so. I was thinking here, maybe I've changed my mind. Maybe if I was king for a day, I'd decide which investors to give more power and which investors to take less power. But in, in, uh, in a moment of, of calm reasoning, I think I'd have to be humble enough that I probably couldn't pick the right ones and that whatever scheme I came up with probably would backfire over time. And I think that's the point here. We need to follow the physician's oath and first do no harm. Uh, we need to, the answer is not to pick winners and losers among investors, but really to make sure that the system is allowing everybody to have a seat at the table and to remember that it's not just uh, the way standards are set on corporate governance, it's really also in the court of public opinion. And uh, this is a, a much more complicated issue than then, uh, which is, will merit much more conversation. I'm glad that we're having it today. So 
The rise of concentrated ownership in the hands of institutional investors has coincided with much more focus by corporate boards on issues around governance processes, oversight of strategy and risk, um, accountability to shareholders, and transparency. And um, I think that there is a causative link there that I would be concerned about interfering with. Um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see the, the Federal Trade Commission getting more active and engaging a lot more on antitrust issues. Um, for a long I've been in Washington for a long time and um, have interacted more with the FTC in the last month than I did in the 10 years before that. And from my perspective, that's a good thing. Um, on this particular topic, I find the analysis a little bit perplexing. And it, it's hard for me to understand both the, the mechanism that institutional investors would use to influence corporate boards in an anti-competitive way and also the motivation to do it. Um, and so that's where I would close. Okay. Just make one, one general point and uh, one specific point. Um, general point, our, our members are, are often called universal owners, so they're owning the whole economy, uh, certainly the whole publicly listed company economy and actually uh, for the bigger funds, pr pr private companies as well. And their interest is in uh, the vitality of the econ economy, the prospering of the economy broadly, uh, which means that antitrust is actually important. Um, so, I, so I think it's very good that the FTC is, is uh, uh, looking at, I think, a variety of, of new, new thoughts about um, you know, where there may be problems, and, that, and that's, all, that's all to the good. That said, in my more narrow, uh, I'm gonna go to my more narrow, narrow point, uh, I, I just don't see it um, and, uh, in, in, in the common ownership. Um, it doesn't seem compelling to me. And just one thing that, that Holly said, mentioned, uh, whatever criticism of, of ISS and Glass-Lewis, the proxy advisory services, is they attempt to reflect their clients and they heavily reflect the, large, the institutional investor community in, in the United States. And um, ISS uh, in particular, uh, its number one issue could be pay for performance on an industry relative basis. That's what they're really pushing. Those are the most salient issues for shareholders and companies. Um, and that seems to me entirely contradictory to the notion that there's uh, 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 not only not a push for um, uh, uh, market restraint, but actually there, there, there's a voice coming, the voice coming from the institutional investor community to the extent that it is, is saying, you gotta do better against your peers. Everybody has said great stuff and I agree with it all. That's all I have to say. No. <laughs> um, I, I've read most of the papers. Um, I read them and um, I obviously have my own experience um, of being involved one way or another um, with the capital markets for over 25 years and I don't see it. Um, I read them um, but I don't see what um, the papers are pointing to with the actual results that they're coming out with. Um, the, my main concern um, is that the sorts of tweaks um, that are being proposed are maybe um, small for, um, for antitrust law, but they're absolutely enormous, just enormous for the capital markets and for asset management. We have the most robust and competitive capital market system for investors in the world here. And I do worry that this sort of a theory, that if these are put in place, it could do tremendous damage to that system. So a couple of things I wanted to touch on, because you're gonna hear about these, I'm sure, in presentations this afternoon. I want you to have some perspective. So one of the things that gets said a lot is diversification across industries is enough diversification. Why do you need it within the industry? And so I'll give you just some examples. In 2017, J.P. Morgan was up 24%, Wells Fargo was up 10. In the aerospace industry in 2018, Lockheed Martin was down 10%, Boeing was up 17. I don't think I need to say more on the importance of idiosyncratic risk within a sector. The second thing you're gonna hear is only rich people invest in mutual funds and so it's not fair that consumer prices for little guys are benefiting the wealthy. So the actual numbers here are the median household income of a mutual fund investor is $100,000. That means that half of the investors earn less than that. So I'm not sure what we want to count as 
um, wealthy versus not wealthy, but clearly many of them investing in their retirement accounts. So I'm going to dub this whole conversation the Goldilocks problem. You heard from Scott, we do too little. You'll hear this afternoon, we do too much. Uh, you hear from some in the middle that we seem to do just about the right amount. Um, I actually believe corporate governance stewardship is a net positive, being active, being involved in these conversations. I don't think it goes anywhere near the topics that are of concern. And then lastly, I did want to thank um, Ed, as well as Martin and Einer for bringing together the chamber, the CII, mm -hmm and AFL-CIO to agree on something, <laughs> even in this very political climate today. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, John Bogle's opinion piece is a really interesting one, because he does raise the prospect of if 50%, if we continue at the current rate, if we continue at the current rate, then in not too many years, 50% of, uh, of, of all assets will be held by the big three, and wouldn't that be a cause for concern. One, one thing to think about in that regard, and that very much is, I think, present in this discussion, is that the asset management world is a, is a very heterogeneous world. And there is a natural balance that emerges between actively managed strategies and passively managed strategies. And the more money goes into the passive strategies, the more profits there are going to be in the active strategies. And so the, the idea that we will get to a point where the big three own 50% of all equities and 50% of all companies is, is extremely unlikely. Uh, and of course, there, there's always the possibility of new entrants both into the, the index, the, the passive strategies, as well in, as into the, the active strategies. But it is something that you know, is worth thinking about as we think about the, the appropriate relationship between shareholders and firms. It's not just one kind of shareholder. There are all sorts of different shareholders, and they have different relationships with firms. Uh, and Delaware law, for what it's worth, doesn't draw any distinctions among the different kinds of shareholders. They, they let shareholders, more or less, do what they want to do. Uh, we're going to break for lunch now until 1 o'clock. And if you will please join me in thanking our panel.